After a series of terrible events, the Joker came back to Gotham and decided that he would conquer everything and hit Batman right where it hurts, and the wallet. Today we're going to be covering the full story of the Joker War, an event that happened in comic books around Batman issue 90 to 100. It's around there from the 2016 run. I hope you guys enjoy. As the rain pours down into a Gotham alleyway, a man falls to his knees, vomiting blood, asking, What did you do? What the hell did you do? A female voice asks the man should she tell him about the Cornix Fleckery. It's a breed of jellyfish that contained enough venom in its body to kill 60 men. A sting from a single specimen can bring an adult man to cardiac arrest in just over a minute. But in the hands of an expert, it can be so, so much worse. The woman walks past the dying man and into the bar asking if they believe the doorman has the audacity to ask her for a password. Merlin steps forward stating that he would have thought the great Cheshire would have taken the advance and ran. Merlin then turns to the two men at the bar stating that he knows the woman, but who are they? A man with an American flag bandana over his face says that his name is the gunsmith and the one peeling the apple is Mr. Teeth. Merlin asks why do they call him that and Mr. Teeth turns around showing his stapled lips and grunts. Cheshire says that that's delightful, where's the boss? And another man walks in stating that he was busy cleaning up her mess. Now everyone quiet down and listen, this is Gotham. What happens next is going to happen fast. Meanwhile, elsewhere, Batman goes out on patrol to try and find a lead on something the Bat computer flagged. There was an alert on the dark web hubs used by assassin guilds. A warning that described a hurricane coming to Gotham in a few days' time. Once translated, it described a major hit being performed by high-end costumed contractors. The post itself was quickly deleted, but it was up long enough to let people know to steer clear of the city. But those that responded have gathered here, each extraordinarily dangerous and expensive. It wouldn't take long to defeat each of them, but the man brought in to run the show, well, that's Deathstroke. His presence in Gotham is worrisome. Deathstroke is discerning, deliberate. Money alone wouldn't bring him back to Gotham. And soon the grappling hook pierces the walls of the hideout. Deathstroke's body is already in motion, his mind calculating where to strike. And within 1.7 seconds, the line wraps around Deathstroke, ripping him out of the building. He laughs, telling him, Sure took you long enough. I won't be able to catch the others tonight, you thought. But I already have. That hook also deployed a series of marble-sized projectors called Shadowcaster. One trained on each target. It projects a shadow in the shape of Batman. They think that they're leading him while they're corralling into a trap. As Batman jumps down, Deathstroke charges into fight, telling him, People have been talking. They say Batman's gone mad, that you've become unhinged. A palm hit to the chin stuns Batman, and as his head whips back, he tells him, I know people are talking. Now shut up and fight. Over in Tri-Corner Yards, a man makes his way into a server room stating that he can do this. He can do this. Everything will be. But just then a whip cracks as it wraps around the man's neck, pulling him to the ground, causing him to release his grip on a small device. Catwoman catches it, stating that he might have pulled it off. You know, if he didn't look so nervous at the party. Now what is this? The man shudders, stating that it's designs. It's plans for the city. New plans to replace Wayne's. You can't let it happen. You can't. And soon the man's eyes begin to bleed and they begin to boil over. A green gas is released from his body and a voice calls out, Testing. Testing. One, two. Catwoman asks, Hello? And the voice says, I can see you. I can see you oh so clearly. And that's one bad, bad kitty cat. Catwoman asks, who is he? And the voice says, you shouldn't pretend not to remember. It always started with the five killers coming to town. That was always step one. The first part of the perfect crime. That's what you called it. Catwoman quietly says no under her breath. And the man falls to the ground as the voice continues speaking, stating that Bruce Wayne has a design for Gotham. But so did they. Back with Batman, he sits down, bruised and bloodied, to finally winning over Deathstroke. He calls up on his comms, Alfred, be ready with five cells and black block. And after a moment of silence, Lucius responds, I'm sorry, Alfred isn't here, Bruce. The rain beads off Batman's mask, and after a few silent moments, he asks him to forgive him. It's been a long time. Call in the Night Climber. It's time to come home, Lucius. Elsewhere in the city, the Riddler stands at his terminal telling Penguin that he's taking it all in. Watching the city from every angle, listening through every microphone. 
Gotham has an equation, and he has set his magnificent mind in solving it. In solving it, he will also solve himself. A riddle with no solution. A riddle befitting. A riddler. I haven't slept in three months. I'm starting to forget the sensation. A military-grade mind-enhancing amphetamines will do that. As the penguin pulls his knife out of the man's throat, he says, I do not appreciate your intrusion. This is a private line and I am working. The Riddler tells him, Listen, this is very important. I'm sorry, I haven't spoken to anyone but myself in quite some time. But anyway, five assassins have been apprehended by our mutual antagonist, the most expensive contract killers. This was the first part. It was always the first part. Penguin stabs at another man, stating, I knew what was happening an hour ago. I've already begun to act accordingly. This devil will find nothing of the penguins worth taking. As the five assassins are taken into custody by the GCPD, Catwoman reports that she found blueprints. Somewhat is attempting to make a play for the Wayne rebuild. They've been looking into this for a week now. Do they have any idea who is moving against Bruce Wayne? What are they planning? And Batman tells her, I can hear the nervousness in your voice. What's wrong? What are you not saying? She says that sometimes seeing a man's head cooked from the inside isn't exactly a good thing to watch. Now focus up. There are dangerous people in this city and there's work to do. Later, in the black block of the GCPD, Batman stands before Deathstroke telling him, Talk. And Deathstroke responds, Fine. Let's get this over with. I'm not going to say who hired me. The others don't know, so don't even bother. Or do, who cares? This cage is cute and all, but it won't matter. The challenge will be nice. Deathstroke then smiles, telling him, The clock is ticking. I need to make my first kill by daybreak and break out of this ridiculous prison. Wish me luck. Batman turns to leave, but then he stops, looking over at Cheshire's cell, telling Bullock, Open it. Bullock tells him that he can't do that. Cheshire's nails, her hair, her clothes, her damn perfume. It's all poison. She's in full quarantine until we get a toxicologist in here. Batman shouts, that's what they're counting on. Open it. The cell door hisses open and as Batman reaches in, he wipes off some of Cheshire's makeup. He runs his fingers through it, stating, This is clay. This isn't Cheshire. Put out an all-points bulletin for Jade Nugent, the assassin known as Cheshire. Deathstroke begins to laugh, telling him, I told you before, it's going to be a good game, Batman. It's going to be exciting to see you lose. Batman rushes out of the jail cell, telling Lucius to find her, and Lucius quickly pulls up the city camera feeds, spotting Cheshire escaping through the back alleys. As Batman gets closer in the night climber, he ejects himself to give chase, riding aboard. Once he hits the ground, he activates the controls, closely following behind her, and as she notices him, she jumps off her motorcycle, landing in Batman's chest. She holds her hands around his head and shocks him, telling him that his heart should stop any second now if he has any last words. And Batman smirks. You should brace yourself. As Cheshire looks back, she slams into a speeding truck while Batman moves underneath, avoiding being hurt. As the truck stops, Batman gets up and Cheshire asks, How did you not? Batman tells her, Membrane in my suit. It coated and sealed the poisons in your nails when you broke the fibers. She begins laughing, telling him, You are very clever. But it doesn't matter. The point wasn't the kill. I just had to keep you busy. We're playing a game tonight, but you won't find out about it until it's all over. You haven't even realized all of the players yet. Back over at the GCPD, Bullock has the officers decontaminate the fake Cheshire cell. Then the killers begin to make their move. Deathstroke and the others quickly disarm the officers, and Deathstroke says, We just have to wait a few more seconds and these doors will open. And that's when a voice comes over the intercom stating, I'm afraid that that's not going to happen. You and your employer have stolen my plans. Nobody steals from the Penguin. Meanwhile, over at the Gotham City Cemetery, Catwoman digs up a grave, shouting, Pick up, damn it! Riddler answers the phone, stating that they haven't used this frequency in years. Kind of bring back memories. Haven't used it since Batman compromised it. She throws another shovel load of dirt over her shoulder, telling him that she isn't with the bat. Just her. And Riddler asks, What do you want? Catwoman sits back, telling him that she needs to know. Is it the real deal or some kind of a trick? Because this was supposed to be over. They took care of this problem years ago. They buried it out here in Potter's Field. Riddler says that the Penguin is already ahead of the situation. He's taking care of it as they speak. Catwoman then says that she doesn't care what the Penguin thinks. What does he think? Riddler tells her that he thinks that they weren't alone when the designer approached them about committing the perfect crime. There was a fourth conspirator, one who usually has a few cards of a sleeve. Riddle me this. Do you or your boyfriend know where the Joker is? 
Catwoman pulls open the coffin lid and sees a decomposing Joker stating, she does now. But as she takes a closer look, she says that it can't be him, not the real him at least. Riddler says that there is someone who could test it and find out. Why not radio him in? Catwoman remains silent and Riddler goes on stating, Lying comes easy to you, doesn't it? Still wondering if this whole thing might resolve itself without telling him? What are you going to do when he learns that you helped build? Is he going to look at you the same way as before, a lover or just another villain like us? Either way, we're all probably going to die and we all probably deserve it. I'm glad that you're going to have the hardest fall of us all though. <laughs> Don't bother calling back. This line is effectively dead. I would wish you good luck, but I don't really want good things to happen to you. So let's just leave it at farewell, Catwoman. As the connection ends, she screams, slamming her arms against the coffin. She pulls herself up, radioing over to Batman, stating that they need to talk. There's something that he needs to know. But before he could answer, a voice comes across stating, he <laughs> can't hear you. She looks up to see the voice coming from the deceased Joker, and he continues, Here, kitty kitty, you weren't going to go and break our deal, were you? You know what'll happen if you do. You know what the designer will do to you. As Catwoman looks back, she sees several men with shovels surrounding her, and as one swings, it cracks her in the side of the head. Dirt is thrown down into the grave, and the voice inside the Joker says, Your death will be pretty boring. It was a good rest while it lasted, though. But someone like me misses the thrill of the chase. You took me down before I could set my master plan in motion. A perfect crime that would make me live forever, and now it's your time to pay for your transgression. Meanwhile, over at the meat processing facility, the penguin shouts at the hanging Deathstroke, asking, Do you know how much money this has cost me? Normally, it would have been enough to pay off a few officers to get inside of the new police building, but this is enough to start opening up investigations! Deathstroke shifts in his chains and drops to his feet, and as he lands, Penguin fires a few shots from his umbrella. Penguin goes on stating, We're both businessmen. How about we make a deal? We could end this now, or you could die. It's really that simple. For the three of you, I will double your contracts, maybe throw in a non-compete for good measure. But for you, what would the price be? Deathstroke scoffs, telling him, you can't afford it. And he grabs one of the chains, whipping it around, knocking out one of the guards. Mr. Teeth and Gunsmith then go drop the guard, and suddenly everyone hears the sound of a speeding car. A second later, Batman comes crashing through as Mr. Teeth lunges, cutting into Batman's shoulder. He takes the hit, grabbing Mr. Teeth by the head, slamming him down onto his knee and breaking his teeth. Gunsmith then opens fire with an umbrella rifle, but Batman turns back, grabbing the gun, bashing the butt end of it into the gunsmith's face. Deathstroke then grabs Penguin, holding a knife to his throat, telling him, That is enough. One more move and the Birdman dies. Someone check the car. Merlin gets up, pulling Cheshire out, telling her that he's got her. And Batman then asks, What is the point of all of this? And the Penguin struggles, stating, You wouldn't dare! Deathstroke pulls out his knife, slicing into the Penguin's throat, and releases the body. As the Penguin falls, Deathstroke says, He'll die unless he gets to the hospital. No cops, no Robins, no Catwoman. You're all alone, Batman, and you won't let him die. Now, we can go after our targets. Batman runs over to apply pressure to the Penguin's neck, but the Penguin gurgles, telling him, There are four of them! Me, Riddler, Joker, and Catwoman. The Underworld united. We did this years ago. It's a shell game, all to beat you, Batman. The designer is real. He is in Gotham City, and he has one true target, Bruce Wayne. And back at Potter's Field, the voice in the Joker tells Catwoman, Give up! You know how this will end. Catwoman claws her way out of the grave and one of the men surrounding her tells her, it's no use running, you dug your own. But before he could finish, he is struck in the side of the head by a large red and black mallet. Catwoman's eyes widen asking, what the hell are you doing here? And Harley Quinn says, she doesn't even want to know how deep this goes. It's enough to drive her nuts. After getting the Penguin to the hospital, Batman quickly returns to the streets to go after the killers who escaped the meat processing facility. His first target is the gunsmith, a veteran of half a dozen military contractors in the Middle East, quietly fired from each for testing experimental weaponry in the field without approval. Nothing a few punches couldn't stop. And as for the two ladies, 
They begin to fight off the designer's henchmen. And Catwoman asks, what happened? Did you get homesick and come back? Harley grabs a hold of one of the men swinging around his head, stating, yeah, I miss the sound of my mallet cracking skulls. Also, the guy in the coffin? Totally not Mr. J. Catwoman says, I figured as much. So who's the stiff? Harley kicks another man, telling her, the guy's name was Artie. Worked with the gang. Sweet kid. Catwoman grabs her whip around one of the men and asks, did the Joker do anything like this before? And Harley says, nah, not his style. When he strikes, he wants Batman to know it's him. Joker has, however, been cleaning house. I've been following clues for a little bit, but the Joker's been leaving a trail of dead clowns. Catwoman then asks her, what are you going on about? And Harley says, well, I'm going to kill him. About time to let go of the past, you know? Just then, Harley thrusts the middle of her mallet in front of Catwoman's face and catches an arrow aimed straight at Catwoman. As Merlin and Cheshire stand off in the distance, Harley asks, is this connected to robo-zombies or Joker? Catwoman tells her, robo-zombies, and Merlin shouts, you have been sentenced to die. While the girls get to work back with Batman, he's following the trail of Mr. T. Seven years prior, there were a series of murders in the Pacific Northwest. Every victim was found with their teeth surgically removed from their mouth and implanted into their stomach. The Portland police dubbed the new serial killer the Tooth Eater, same as Gunsmith. Nothing a few punches can't fix. But while Batman is subduing Mr. Teeth, he realizes something. This place at the Rin, it's the Riddler's hideout. His computer systems are all locked except for his security feed. And as Batman gets to work on the computer, a video plays with the Riddler and a man in a white mask with the letter D across it. Lucius radios in that he did a scan. No costume is pinging on the guy. Perhaps the man was hired by Deathstroke and the others? But while Batman is watching, he sees Riddler making gestures with his hand. A sequence of numbers, 774469. And using an alphanumeric keypad, it would spell out Sphinx. It's the Sphinx Riddle. What walks on four legs in the morning, two legs in the midday, and three legs in the evening. And Lucius says, Man, which in alphanumeric is, and Batman keys in, 626. The computer pings as it unlocks, and Batman tells Lucius, I'm going to get this information to the Bat computer. Lucius looks through some of the files and says that he did find a location on Deathstroke through Riddler's cameras. This could be a chance to test out a new fleet of Bat Spawn drones. As dozens of Bat drones make their way into the city, Catwoman and Harley Quinn arrive carrying the bodies of Merlin and Cheshire, with Harley asking, Where should we stick the murder people? Batman points in the corner and then looks at Catwoman, telling her, We need to talk. She looks down, telling him, yeah. But then Batman brings up the image of the masked man asking her, who is he? Realizing that it's not exactly the talk that she thought they were going to have, Catwoman shouts, you had the Riddler. Penguin is in danger and the Joker is, well, maybe ready to come out of hiding? Harley chimes in, yeah, there's a whole thing the Joker's cooking up. Batman takes Catwoman by the arm, telling her, now we need to talk in private. Catwoman says that his name is the designer. Years ago, she made a deal with him. So did Gotham's biggest villains. She'll tell him everything, but first, she just needs to tell him. She's sorry. While Harley is controlling the fleet of drones like she's playing a video game, Batwoman and Catwoman leave to avoid Harley listening in. Catwoman looks out at the construction site, stating that it's beautiful. All these strange skeletons of a whole new city growing out of the old one. And Batman reaches out to her. But as Catwoman pulls away, Batman tells her, You need to tell me everything. She begins her story, telling him that it all started years ago. Not quite the beginning, but soon after. She found a card on her pillow with an ornate D stamped on it, with a peer number and time. The D was from someone everyone thought was an urban legend. He was a master criminal, a man who concocted the greatest crimes you've never heard of. But when she arrived, she saw that there were others. The Joker, Penguin, Riddler, Soon after, one of the designer's men appeared to take them to the mysterious house. As they walked up, the designer greeted them, walking them to the Tataris house. Before they could begin, they're required to disarm at the door. So all the villains got rid of all of their weapons, and they walked in. They settled in, and the designer set everyone for dinner at his table and told them a story. You see, in his youth, he faced a man similar to Batman, one of the finest detectives the world had ever seen. And after being thwarted so many times, the designer needed to think bigger, better. He needed to craft a crime to deduce the way the detective would thwart it and then unthwart the thwarting. But no matter what he thought of, it always ended the same, and that's when it occurred to him. He'd been playing the game on the detective's terms. If he was going to design a crime with one degree of complexity, the detective would come back with two degrees. Defeating him would require an exponential leap forward. So, for a year, 
He sat in a room doing just that. He knew that in order to win, he must become the man that he would be after 20 years of battling the detective without ever letting the detective evolve his mind. The man who left that room wasn't the man who entered. He became the designer. After that, the detective failed and was broken and humiliated. Ultimately, the detective died in the shadow of his former self. So the designer is here to offer his help. He will sit down each of them and come up with a perfect crime to become Gotham's underworld elites while giving him half their earnings. And they'll never see him again. Everyone agreed, and the designer took each of them, one by one, into a separate room to come up with a plan. One so perfect, there would be no way that Batman could actually stop it. Penguin, Riddler, herself, they all came and went. That's when the Joker went in. He was in there with the designer for what seemed like forever. And then the door opened and the designer stepped out, shouting to his men to kill them all. As the designer held his sword to Penguin's throat, he yelled that the Joker showed him what kind of city this was and what it's going to become in time. But before he could go on, there was a gunshot. The Joker shot the designer in the back of the head. He then laughed and he proceeded to shoot everyone else in the room. They all agreed to keep this a secret, but the Joker, something in him changed that night. His eyes were different something evil. As Catwoman finishes, Batman says that there is still something that she isn't telling him. Catwoman tells him that this is the hardest part because if the designer is back with all of their plans, then he needs to know the target of her planned heist. Batman turns and says, I already know it's me, my family's money, it's Wayne Enterprises, it's billions of dollars. The designer still has your plans and I'm about to lose everything. Snyder College. The campus is crowded with students wearing their favorite superhero costume. And inside of her dorm room, the Dean speaks to Alexis, asking her to show a little remorse for her actions today. But she argues, causing him to tell her to be reasonable. Then say something, Dean Bob. Otherwise, I've got a chemistry final to study for. The Dean tells her that her attitude is why the school board doesn't think that she is taking things seriously. Your roommate has a brother living in Gotham. Three of his co-workers were killed in a laughing gas attack last week. That's why the school put together this Dress Like Your Hero Day. We wanted students to focus on the people who make this world better. You had to know that your choice would be provocative, Dean Bob tells Alexis. She smiles as she sits on her bed, dressed in a Joker t-shirt smoking a cigarette. No oh, crap, she grins. Dean Bob begins to stand, telling her that he tried to come to her. He tried to be a friend, but she tells him to shut up. You came because this scares the ever-living crap out of you, and you know it's dangerous. She snaps at him. She knows that he wants her to say that this is all a cry for help, that she's maladjusted, and that he can help her and get an award. She leans down, puffing her cigarette and blowing the smoke into his face. Then you wouldn't have to admit that I actually believe in something dangerous and that I might not be the only one. That it might have been growing under your nose the entire time, she tells him. Dean Bob giggles ever so slightly. He composes himself, not sure what came over him. He begins to break out, laughing harder. What did you, what did you do? <laughs> he begins to laugh, gasping between the breaths. I got the recipe off the internet. I don't know if it's going to work right. You wouldn't believe how many chemicals are in it, she tells him. She pulls out her phone, beginning to film the Dean, telling him, just don't fight it. I want everything on camera, she tells him with a smile, and she turns away, beginning to put on different makeup, pulling her hair up. She tells him that he wasn't her first, that she's been experimenting on the homeless for a little while. You're the first that matters, though. I'm going to dress you up and put you in Sarah's bed. You know her brother met those guys who died once? She's been playing it up for social media. She tells him as she puts her hair up and her makeup on. But I'll give you the kind of scare that she'll remember. She'll go from pretending she's scared and offended by a Joker t-shirt to seeing his face in her nightmares for the rest of her life. Dean Bob, don't you think it's funny? The man is crying now, his face twisted in a grin as he says that he won't laugh. Do you even believe your opinions anymore? Or just what the board has programmed into you? She asks him. Dean Bob begins to fall to the ground, his body convulsing as he asks her why she's like this. She begins to change, 
telling him that it's obviously her parents' fault or television. That she grew up with the world whispering that she could be anything that she wanted. Some of us don't want to be the good guys. Some of us don't want to live in the slow decay of your world. I want to build my own world. I want the whole world to be built as a joke. She tells him, whirling around, revealing her full costume. And I'm the punchline! Bob can't hold it in anymore. He bursts out laughing, his mouth twisted in a hideous grin as he falls to the ground, shaking uncontrollably. Punchline is looking at the man, but not speaking to him. You said you wanted me to prove that I was serious before you let me in on this big plan of yours. That you needed to see that I wasn't a creepy fangirl. Well, here's your proof. I'm ready to get serious, she says over her shoulder, looking at the closet. And the door creeps open, revealing the Joker's hideous face as he steps out into the room. Serious? No, my dear punchline. What comes next is going to be funny! <laughs> See, they may have the idea of what happened here, but the story that people are telling you isn't true. And I am here to tell you the truth. Once upon a time, four crooks walked into a haunted house to have dinner with the devil. The devil was pleased with each of them for their mighty sins that they had committed, and wanted to give each of them a boon. The devil set them down one by one, asked what they wanted more than anything in the world. The old bird said that he wanted the king, for all to follow his command. And so the devil gave the numbers of the finest killers in the land, so that he could take down the nation's rulers. The second crook was a mad crooked man, who said that he wanted to be the wisest man in all of the kingdom. So the devil gave him a crooked game to play with the greatest scholars in the kingdom, which would kill each of them in turn. The third crook was a thieving cat. She wanted to be the richest person in the kingdom, while the devil gave her the keys to the vaults of all of the richest men in the world so that she could rob them blind, and the fourth crook was a jest. And see, he'd been laughing this whole time because he and he alone understood the devil's game. With no wise, powerful, or wealthy men left to stop him, the city wouldn't belong to the three crooks at all, it would belong to the devil. In time, it would be the jester's turn. And the devil asked what he wanted more than anything in the world. And the jester said, I want to be the devil. And then the jester killed him. The man behind the bar asks why he's telling him this. And the joker says, it's to add a little context to tonight's entertainment. Make sure everyone can follow all the funny little jokes. The last bartender wasn't laughing at all. So I had to set him straight to make sure that there's no more salt around the rim next time. The Joker grabs the phone and he makes a call. He asks the person on the other end if everything's ready and they tell him yes. So the Joker takes a sip of his margarita telling them, good, good. I want to bring down the house with this one right down on your head. While the Joker is scheming though, Batman takes the Night Climber and flies up to find Deathstroke. However, while the fight begins, Catwoman returns inside with Harley Quinn telling her that they need to go and keep watch on the assassins. Harley jumps up asking, Do I look like a babysitter? As the door to the holding room opens up, Catwoman and Harley see that their captives are gone. On the screen, the designer appears and he tells them that he has removed some pieces off of the board. They won't be needed in the great design. He is not in the business of making the Penguin a mayor of Gotham. Catwoman tells him that Batman knows what's planned and the designer says, yes, yes, my dear kitty cat, played her part perfectly. Now he's ripping apart his own mind, trying to outthink me. Out above Gotham, Batman is doing exactly that. How is he supposed to outsmart someone who lives to outsmart people? Deathstroke says, you're not gonna kill me. You wouldn't risk throwing ourselves off this thing. And Batman tells him, I didn't fly the two of us up here so that I could throw you off. Look down. There are nine million people living at Gotham. Innocent people who spent the last few years in a kind of constant rolling hell. People are scared like they've never been before. All I'm trying to do is give them some kind of peace. Deathstroke asks, am I supposed to care? And Batman stops him. You do. Deathstroke then asks, who are these people even afraid of? And Batman yells, I know it's me! I spent my career using my wealth and power to fight costumed madmen, but they keep coming back. I have to make something bigger, more frightening each time. 
So right now I'm trying to change that. I'm trying to make it all better. Make it right. I need people like you to stop. Deathstroke tells him. No. And Batman throws himself into Deathstroke and they both go barreling down towards the streets below. As they fall, Deathstroke tells him. We just skip to the part where you take out the grappling hook and save us both. Batman grits his teeth doing just that, but late enough to allow both of them to take a hard hit when landing. Destro gets back up telling him, All right, now that we got that out of the way, let's just wrap this whole thing up, Batman. And on the screen before them, the designer tells them, I don't think so. Your part in the design is over. Consider your contract terminated, Deathstroke. Deathstroke looks over, seeing some of the designer's men shuffling towards them. And he looks to Batman. Yeah, we got some company. Batman tells him, we. And Deathstroke says, I'm pretty sure the designer has no intention of paying me. The designer then asks Batman, how are you feeling? Are you up for another game? This is getting tiresome. Batman yells, we can just end it. Come on, face me. But then a shadow appears telling him, now that wouldn't be fair. And the Riddler steps into view smiling. I haven't taken my turn yet. As the Penguin sits up in his hospital bed, he asks Commissioner Bullock how might he be of service to the Gotham Police Department today. Bullock scoffs, stating, For starters, you're under arrest for the murder of three police officers. Oh, that can't be right. I was kidnapped by some very bad people who believe that I should have been in GCPD custody. In fact, I would like to press charges against the assassin known as Deathstroke. Do I tell you that to the lawyer? Bullock yells, I will find something to pin on you. But before he could go on, one of the officers pulls open the curtains to the window, stating, Uh, we have a problem. The city has turned green. Bullock sighs. Oh, it never ends, does it? Back down in the streets, the Riddler appears on all of the TV screens across the city. Hello, Gotham! It's your good old friend, the Riddler. And have I got a game for you. Deathstroke asks, what the hell is going on? And Riddler goes on. We're gonna go over some rules. Name of the game, Crossword. The grid is the city itself, meaning you're all going to be staying put for the time being. Letters guessed correctly will connect the blocks together. When the grid is solved, the city will be open. The walls will come down, and you will all be able to move freely. But who among you is going to play my game? A great question, dear listeners. Why? It's the greatest mind, your greatest champion, Batman! As the drones fly down to record Batman, Batman tells Lucius, Get a location. Lucius responds, stating, Already working on it, but he's making it difficult. He doesn't. But before Lucius could finish, the transmission is cut. And Riddler says, There will be no cheating in my game. All calls, transmissions, and other forms of contact are being blocked off. Better get some scrap paper and write this all down. Because if you guess wrong, the bombs will go off now. Riddle me this! Meanwhile, in the sewers beneath Gotham, Harley is following Catwoman, stating that she always figured the hero types had a much better route to take. But this place stinks. The good guys always stink less. Harley asks if she's sure. Catwoman says that she's not feeling particularly heroic right now. How about they change the subject? And Harley says, are you sure? Because that smell, it's not coming from the sewers. It's probably coming from that undead muscle the designer has left for us. Catwoman sighs, seeing the reanimated corpses crawling out of the water. And then Harley then swings her mallet, yelling, And I hate zombie cops! Topside, Batman is fighting through the corpses, telling Deathstroke to follow him down to the train station. Riddler says, Hey now! That's not fair! You're not playing fair! Batman punches another undead, yelling, Just ask the damn questions! Riddler then says, Okay! What across nine spaces? The more I take, the more I leave behind. Batman bashes another undead, stating, Footsteps. Riddler goes on. Eight down, five spaces. What has many keys but can open no doors? Batman kicks another undead. Piano! Just then, the train flies in, and as Deathstroke looks at it, he asks, Really? You have a bat train? And Batman tells him, Just get on. Meanwhile, Batman continues to answer the Riddler's questions, but back down below, Harley splatters another undead cop with Catwoman yelling, Let me in, damn it! There are rules to these things. Selena Kyle, member 13432. The hologram of a masked man appears and says that it appears that she is not alone. And Catwoman says that this is her guest, Doorman. She has come to speak with the underbroker. She needs to make a withdrawal. She has the account numbers and she is a member in good standing. Doorman opens the hidden door, stating, You may enter, but to be quick, we can't let the riffraff in. 
as they tumble in several armed men in clown masks around them and a female voice states that she thought that there wouldn't be any company. The underbroker says that he is a deal maker, always open to a plan that benefits everyone. And Catwoman asks who the hell is that, but the woman says that if the two of them are jokes and trust her, they are, then she would be the punchline. I'm where you end. Harley looks at Punchline's makeup asking, are you like a fan or something? And Punchline says, no, definitely not a fan. Harley then says, okay, well, we don't have time for any of this. We're robbing a bank. Punchline tells her, oh, I know. That's why I'm here robbing the same bank. Harley looks a little closer and stops. Hey, wait a minute. Why are you dressed like a clown? And Catwoman asks, really? This is the Joker's new girlfriend, Harley. Punchline laughs. <laughs> Actually, I'm his partner. Harley walks up and says, well, aren't you funny? Because you don't sound funny. Punchline smiles. What's going to be funny is what I do with your skin. Harley sighs, stating, I've had a few years, I've had a few come to God moments and long cries in the shower, but right now, that pretty little head is about to be smashed with my giant hammer. While the fight between Harley and Punchline begins, the underbroker begins to run, stating, I'm sorry that we couldn't make a deal. But suddenly he feels a whip crack and wrap around his neck. As Catwoman pulls, she begins to state, Your name is Harlan Graves. You're a senior partner at Graves, Willick, and Crane. You live in a townhome off of Robinson Park East. You keep a private safe on the third floor behind the what is not an original Rembrandt. She leans down asking, now should I tell everyone who is here the combination? You know, date it in front of two of the largest killers in Gotham? The underbroker tells her, no. And Catwoman tells him, okay, let's talk about what you can do for me. Back topside at the Riddler's hideout, he shouts into camera stating, Batman is a cheater! Do you hear me, Batman? You are a cheater! Batman appears behind him stating, I can hear it all. Now, Eddie, it's time to give the little brain a rest. He sticks him with a trank dart, and the Riddler says that that sounds nice. Deathstroke then asks, what about me? And Batman turns around, shooting him with a trank dart. Deathstroke begins to fall to the ground as a voice says, well, this is going very well. You've unraveled your adversary's designs quite adequately. However, it won't be enough. Because if you can't tell, this is Bruce Wayne's officers. The designer looks into the screen, stating, Hello, Bruce. Please come in. We should talk a little before I kill you with my ultimate plan. A short while later, now that all of the designer's plans have been squashed, Batman stands before him, telling him, How was this supposed to go? If it all happened all those years ago, show me the full picture, your grand design. The designer asks him, you want me to explain what you already know? No, how about you explain everything that I've just accomplished? And Batman tells him, you would have had five of the highest paid assassins of the world come to Gotham. They would eliminate the mayor of Gotham, the deputy mayor, the public advocate, the city controller, and the majority leader of the city council. The kills would all be done simultaneously and the assassins would then just leave Gotham. This would now plant Penguin in position of power, and overnight, he would run the city's politics. The Riddler would then cripple the city, his puzzle locking down every block, but it serves its primary purpose of isolating the different police precincts and humiliating his target, Commissioner Jim Gordon. The real answer to the puzzle was always to let the Riddler win. The cops who are smart enough would agree to work for him, and they'd be allowed to pass and save the city. Penguin's mayor would then appoint a Riddler loyalist to the police commissioner and district attorney's offices. The public would suppose that there is new order, having survived the chaos that you created before. The GCPD now effectively working for the Riddler. Catwoman would hack her way into the accounts of the wealthiest men in Gotham City. She would have learned that the Wayne Foundation was funded by offshore accounts. With those account numbers, she would be able to drain their full assets and redistribute them as she saw fit. She would become the richest woman in Gotham overnight. She would become the central bank for the growing crime empire in Gotham. And the Joker? The Joker would kill Batman and Robin. And with the underworld united, the designer's final act is establishing the greatest criminal empire of the next generation, an unstoppable machine. The designer's legacy is secured and his story can come to an end. The designer stands up. It would have been magnificent, wouldn't it? This office was made to look like the study back at the manor. You can imagine why. The ideas that Bruce Wayne would have, would they be enough to save you? Batman takes out a sword telling him, I am not the man that I once was. I have evolved. I am not equal to the designer. The designer pulls out his own sword and tells him, well then we shall find out if that is true, on God. 
back in the secret offices of the Underbroker. Punchline slashes at Harley, and Harley dodges, stating, You're pretty quick with those, huh? Punchline tells her that it helps when you have a grudge, and Harley asks, What did I ever do to you? And Punchline yells, You tried to fix the Joker! Tried to make him better. Harley stops and thinks for a moment and then says, Wait, 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 wait! You're a groupie! You're a Joker groupie! Punchline goes on stating that she could have been running this horror show at his side, but now she's going to be carved up by her replacement. Harley tells her, First off, the Joker hates it when you try to name stuff for him. His sense of humor would be less horror carnival and more chuckle hut. Harley then takes one of the rifles from the clowns and begins to shoot, but as Punchline ducks and weaves through the gunfire, she runs past Harley. Before Harley could turn, she feels something sliding across her neck, and she quickly reaches up to grab the spot. As she gurgles, blood begins to pour out of the hole. Punchline then asks, Where's the comeback? Where's the snappy Harley Quinn zinger? You can't even choke it out through the blood. Punchline then kicks the gun from Harley, telling the clowns to go ahead and open up the door. It's time for her to flush out the rest of the sewage. Once Harley is thrown out into the sewer, though, Punchline looks back, stating, All right, time to fleece the cat. Back at Wayne Enterprises, Batman and the designer are clashing swords, with the designer stating that he has an incredible mind, but he is missing one piece. And Batman tells him, no, he isn't. He put it all together on the way here, while he was solving the Riddler's crossword. He saw the one game piece out of the configuration, not part of the original design. He had someone hack into Wayne Enterprises computers, and it seems like he was replacing blueprints for Tri-Corner Yards. But the man wasn't trying to take something, he was trying to hide something. They wanted to see how he was funding the Wayne rebuild. He doesn't care about the design, the vision of an underworld united. It's never been what he wanted. The designer underestimated Gotham City and most of all, the cloud. He thought the Joker would fall in line with the rest, but the Joker didn't want to kill Batman. The truth is the designer couldn't understand what the Joker was. He gazed into the abyss and it stared back and it consumed him. Batman rips the designer's mask off to reveal the withered corpse and he goes on stating, and you're not the designer. You're just a shambling shell of the greatest villain of an older generation cut down by his replacement. What are you doing, Joker? Why attack me like this? As the designer's head falls to its side, the faint laughter of the Joker can be heard, and he says, Oh, it's all a part of the plan. It wasn't about breaking you. It's about what comes next. This is a whole war planned out by me. This is about breaking her. Batman begins to process everything and then realizes who the Joker is talking about. Catwoman. Joker sips his drink as he's sitting and he says, I'm still going to be needing to send you off the table for the next bit. Oh, Slady! Wakey, wakey! It's time to finish your contract! As Batman turns, he sees Deathstroke standing over him with a knife, and he says, Sorry, Batman, but you and your whole family, you've earned this. The knife slams down into Batman's leg as he screams out in pain. Deathstroke kneels down, telling him, This isn't going to kill you, but if you remove the knife, it definitely will. You better call Mr. Fox and get medical out here now. Joker then tells Deathstroke that he might want to skip town. Things are about to get dangerous! Meanwhile, back with Catwoman, she works away at transferring the money, telling the Underbroker that she's going to need them to erase her account. The Underbroker says that he's sorry, but her account is quite empty. At that moment, a gun is fired, and Catwoman slumps over. Punchline says that she appreciates the account numbers, Kitty Cat. This next bit wouldn't be possible without you. A few moments later, Joker gets a call from Punchline and he asks if it's down. She says yes, and Joker tells her that he wants to hear it. Say the words. Punchline tells him that right now the Joker is worth $100 billion. And he laughs, and he laughs, and he laughs. Years ago, Batman found himself in a similar situation with the Joker. And as always, Alfred was there backing him up. As Batman races through the city, Alfred asks if he's thinking about them, the bodies, the test subjects at the chemical plants. How many has this Joker figure already killed? Batman tells him, 24. I expect there to be more bodies at the reservoir. Alfred says that they can bring this nightmare to an end, but Batman thinks that this is not the end. It's too difficult to put into words. His motivations are beyond anything that they've encountered before. It feels like an oversimplification to call the Joker insane. 
Batman has seen more bodies than he can count, but there's always been a reason behind those murders. Whether it's a means to an end or some kind of thrill. But to the Joker, those bodies are just meat. The city, this whole world, the people in it, they're already dead in his eyes. Alfred asks, there's more, isn't it? Something that you aren't saying. And Batman tells him, all of these killings, it feels like some kind of a test to understand my limits. It's like the Joker knows that I'm going to lose. He already knows that he wants to come back next time and the time after. It's as if he's the only other person in the world that thinks he's alive. It's as if I'm the only other person in the world that he thinks is alive and because of that, our battle may never end. Alfred laughs. Well, Master Bruce, at least you won't be waging it alone. You don't think I'd let you fight a murderous nightmare clown for the rest of time on your own, do you? Now the entrance to the viaduct is on your left. Get ready to ram through the gate in three, two, but now we go to the current time. The time where Alfred is dead. Batman is alone. And he's exploding through the same gate trying to track down the Joker. But as the Joker's clowns give chase, Batman sees a dead end up ahead. One of the clowns jumps out shouting that there's nowhere left to run, that this city doesn't belong to the Bat anymore. The clown then takes aim with his RPG, firing right into the Batmobile. And as that car explodes, the clowns get closer and they find that the inside is already empty. The clown takes out his phone, calling Punchline, the Joker's new sidekick, telling her that they've got another shell. No bat meat on the inside of this one. Punchline tells him, you know what, that's okay. We have just finished hacking the main computer here at Wayne Enterprises. The Joker did always love Batman's little names for everything. Says that Batman pretends it's the kids who named them. But the Joker knows better. Now, Mr. Fox, focus. You're now Joker CEO. And you must tell him everything in a sweet little head. Let the toxin do the work. What do you call this place? Lucius tries to fight back the urge to talk, but he suddenly begins to laugh. <laughs> the hibernaculum. Punchline sighs. And that's where bats breed. That's disgusting! You've been breeding all sorts of little bats, haven't you? Lucius begins to speak again, but this time he asks, <laughs> Where is Joker? Punchline asks, Where would you go if you were suddenly worth almost $100 billion? You'd go shopping. Meanwhile, at the Monarch Theater in Park Row, the curator says that the people used to call this place Crime Alley. Couldn't walk down the streets without getting into some real trouble. And if it ever got too late, he used to sleep up on the old reels. Joker says, Oh, it must have been very hard. And the curator goes on telling him, Yeah, especially for the Waynes, too. The dad used to like taking the son here, watch the movies that he grew up on. It's funny. It sounds like there are people down in the theater. But the Joker tells him, Oh, it's probably the wind. Old theaters just get that way. The curator then says that it's hard to say goodbye to this place. The boy, Bruce, he came by with a few offers. But I'd be crazy to turn down this offer. I could buy a whole town back in coal country where my grandkids are. Joker tells him, And you should make yourself mayor. Get some t-shirts. It's a fun game while it lasts. The curator asks, are you sure there's no one down there? It sounds like people are laughing. Joker picks up a reel labeled The Mask of Zorro and says, Well, why don't you go join them in the audience? The show is about to start. And down below, the theater is packed with those infected with the Joker's toxin. Meanwhile, outside of Wayne Enterprises, Batman is scaling the side of the building, listening in for any locations that he can enter. And once he stops hearing voices, he scans the floors to see how many people are in the building. And as his visor lights up, he sees dozens of armed men across all of the floors. After climbing to the top, he sneaks into the main computer room, and he tells the computer to search for the Joker. Punchline comes out of the shadows, stating, He isn't here right now! As she hits him in the back of the head, she asks, Was this supposed to be your secret hideout or something? Your friend, Mr. Fox, outlined six micro caves in this building. Six! It's like you planned every type of attack on Gotham. A cave to prepare for each different crisis. But this one was my favorite. And you want to know why? This is the one you haven't earned yet. It's the one you were going to unlock when you and Mr. Fox and Mr. Wayne had finished building the new Gotham. As Punchline attacks, she presses a button and the door begins to open, and inside a new type of bat suit stands. Batman looks over at the advanced suit, asking, When? Who? Lucius, did you design this? 
Lucius tries to hold back his laughter. <laughs> no, I found it in the computer. I thought it was you. Punchline bursts out laughing. Did you really think that we were the crazy ones? It's too bad that you're not going to get your beautiful city of the future. No new toys, no new duds. At that moment, Batman begins to stumble back. I, I don't understand. And Punchline goes on. You're looking pretty rough. Her death stroke got you pretty good. Oh, I know what it is. It's the poison in the room, Batman. I spent the last few years building up my immunities to it. It's a little blend of my own. Some of the Joker's toxin tweaked with a little bit of the fear toxin and a little bit of venom for good measure. Batman trips as he tries to run through the window and that's when he hears a voice. Master Bruce, not that way, you're going backwards. Batman turns, Alfred, Alfred. Batman stares out the window directly at an armed bat jet and Alfred yells, I've taken all of your vehicles. Master Bruce, you need to get out of there. Batman responds, no, it's not real. You're dead, dead. And Alfred tells him, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. They're all dead now. And that's when the jet fires its payload right into the window. Gotham City, years from now. The city is a shining beacon, with gardens growing on rooftops of the glass towers that reach into the bright sky. Alfred chimes in on the radio as Batman speeds through his utopia. Sir, we've located the vehicle. Our drones are mapping potential routes. 90% of them are taking atoms, Alfred tells Batman. Batman adjusts his bike, and Alfred informs him that a pedestrian is walking into the collision zone. Send a signal. No one dies in this city. Not ever again, Batman tells Alfred. The young man in question is about to cross the street, and he suddenly gets a ping on his phone. Please step back, the message tells him, with a bat signal over it. Whoa, I got a bat signal, the kid gasps. And suddenly an ice cream truck goes flying by him right where he was about to step. Yeah, it's Batman! The kid yells as Batman flies by on his bike right behind the truck. His armor shining in the bright daylight like one of the very towers above them. Batman smiles. Victor, I'm jamming all your radio frequencies. I know you can hear me. If you surrender now, no one needs to get hurt. Batman says over the radio. The truck suddenly screeches to a halt with Mr. Freeze and his two sons stepping out into the light. Remind him what family he's dealing with. Freeze tells his boys who step up and blast the bat cycle with their freeze guns slowing it. Sir, activating the heat array. The ice density should allow escape in three, two, Alfred chimes in. The cycle roars through the ice, forcing Freeze to order his two children behind him. I can take the bat, he tells them. But Batman launches himself off the bike, flying through the air. No, Victor, you can't. He hisses, activating his heater rings, throwing them at the two young boys. They drop, stunned, by the attack as Batman lands on Victor Freeze. Your boys will be fine, I promise. And so will you, Victor. Batman tells the villain. Later, Batman returns to the cave and he's met by a smiling Alfred. That's the first time that you've gone out all month. That has to be a record, Master Bruce. Bruce nods, removing the cowl, revealing the graying corners of his hair. He smiles to Alfred, telling him that he needs to call Barbara and figure out how Freeze got a hold of his old tech. The boys will need help. I called Leslie on the way in. She and Harper are going to check at them in the morning, he tells Alfred. And then he looks at the holographic map of his city as Alfred tells him that he is happy and that he and Mrs. Wayne are making their trip to Shanghai. Any surprises up there for me, Alfred? He asks as they ascend the stairs into Wayne Manor. But Alfred isn't with them anymore. I can hear it in your voice. How much you love the sound of those words as they cross your lips, the man says, his voice now growing strange. Bruce turns back as Alfred twists his neck at a hard angle, snapping it. It hangs off his head, bones broken and dangling. But you know they're all lies. You don't get a happy ending, Bruce. You die alone with no family, no love as the city falls into his hands. Alfred tells him slowly, his mouth beginning to form a hideous smile and a faithful friend begins to laugh. <laughs> no! Bruce screams as the laughter echoes all around him. <laughs> no! Batman yells again, sitting up sharply to find himself on the floor of an old apartment. Harley Quinn leaning against the wall nearby. Hey, you're not dead. That's good. 
She says, leaning into the light, showing her combat gear and jagged scar on her neck. She survived punchline slitting her throat. I was betting myself that you were probably dead, she tells him. Batman falls back down, his body weak as he looks at the woman. Catwoman said that you were hurt, he whispers to her. Harley nods, telling him. I got hurt plenty. Knifeline or whatever her name is, she tried to shut me up. But this mouth doesn't shut up easy. She tells him, smiling evilly as she motions at her scar. Batman struggles, asking her how long he's been out. Three days since I found you. Since they say you blew up a pot of Wayne Enterprises. She explains that Gotham City is now Joker's town. He makes the rules. All of the gangs have joined him. He's paying them and giving them tons of toys. Joker mobiles, Joker cycles, Joker planes. She says, and she tells him that the nights are the worst. The regular folks don't know what to do and some people are taking matters into their own hands. Speaking of which, elsewhere in the city, a clown is hunting a family, knife in hand, when suddenly a battering stabs him in the back of the head and a young boy is standing there. The mother stands up still afraid, looking at the young boy. Son, are you okay? She asks shakily. No, ma'am. I'm not even a little bit okay, but... I'm going to see how I feel after I kill a bunch of these clowns, he tells her. But cutting back to Batman and Harley. It's bad. Harley finishes shining a light into Batman's dilated pupils. And you're still dosed on whatever the stabby broad gassed you with. It's not the old stuff, it's like a new strain. Batman pushes her away, demanding to know where the Joker is, and she explains that Punchline is running things from Wayne Enterprises, and that they just bought up Ace Chemicals. The underbroker is dealing with the police, keeping everyone afraid and compliant. But Mr. J, he's up to something different. He's bought up all the ad time in Gotham. It runs over and over. See for yourself, she says, showing him her cracked phone. On the phone, a man is sitting before the camera tied up, and across his face is a jagged cut, forming a Z. Fear is in his voice as he reads off the card. A thrilling adventure in romance and vengeance. The story of a man reborn as a hero. The story of a symbol that he would use to mark the world. The story of Zorro, remastered and better than ever. This is the Gotham cut. Only three people saw the ending last time and it changed the course of history. What happens when everyone sees the real ending? The Mark of Zorro is now playing back to back at the Monarch Theater. Wide release is only days away. Coming to every movie house in the city. A movie so good, so daring. We're paying you to come and see it. $10,000 for every person who sees it opening night. The man says, sweat beginning to pour down his face. The video ends with a loud bang and Batman rubs his head. Images of the monarch and the night his parents were killed beginning to flood his mind. Aw, oh, jeez, you're losing it again. You gotta keep your head on straight. If you go crazy, Mr. J's gonna kill you. Harley yells, shaking Batman as he sees images of his parents with their necks snapped, their heads dangling from their shoulders, hideous grins on their faces. Batman snaps back, throwing Harley across the room, when suddenly he hears a voice over the radio. It's Alfred. The very Alfred that is dead, warning him that Harley has a syringe behind her back. Batman avoids the attack, leaping out the window into the night air as Harley calls out to him. Gotham needs you to get your shit together or we're all gonna die! She shouts at him. Batman moves through the city fast, finally landing in an alleyway. Are you alright, sir? Alfred asks. I'm having a bit of a psychotic break here. Batman admits to his faithful ally. Just a bit? That's a relief. You're not real, but I'm gonna deal with that later. Batman tells him, hiding from the Joker's drones as they fly past. You wounded me, sir. I'm here to help you. I promised you that I'd always be here to help. Batman needs to move quickly, refusing to lose the city again. But he pauses from the rooftop, looking down on a group of Joker clowns that are attacking the people. He leaps down among them, attacking them quick and furiously. And in a matter of moments, he's gone, slipping back into the shadows of Gotham's rooftops. Shortly afterwards, though, he glides down to the pavement outside of the Monarch Theater, where once the theater was old and decrepit, now it is shiny and new, rebuilt with the money that the Joker stole. It's like I remember it, like it's brand new. It's like it was that night. Batman whispers as he pushes through the doors. He's trying to get under your skin, sir. Alfred warns him. Batman nods as he steps into the lobby, telling Alfred that it's working. I'm not sure if it's the hallucinations making me see the theater this way, or if the Joker used my money to do it for real. Batman whispers. He pushes open the doors to the actual theater, stunned by the smell that is wafting out. Rot. It's death, Alfred. It smells like death in here. Give me their vitals. Batman whispers, giving into the sound of Alfred's voice. There's no heartbeat in the room except yours. 
Alfred tells him. Bruce moving through the theater, through the crowd of the dead. He doesn't understand why would the Joker bring these people here. It looks like they've been decaying for years. Suddenly, the screen lights up, revealing the Joker. Oh, that's because they have been. Their family, our family, they're the people that I've helped see to the other side of the veil. I've had clowns digging for days, Batman, and I've given them a bit of the borrowed tech from a friend, the designer. He tells Batman as the corpses' mouths all begin to open, revealing the green gas. They begin to move, contorted and twisted, turning, staring at Batman. And they've all got a bit of a bone to pick with you. See, you should have been here to save them, but you weren't. You won't even save the rest of the city either. The Joker yells, his laughter echoing in the theater as the dead begin to rise. <laughs> Dry corner yards, the docks of Gotham. Punchline looks at the shipment of yellow barrows with their toxic symbols and turns back to the broker. Is this everything I asked for? Every canister? The broker checks his manifest, telling her that they got everything. Even managed to purchase a ship to make sure it all got here on time. I freaking love being rich! She hisses with a wicked smile. She turns to the crew of clowns that have surrounded her, telling them to finish loading the canisters up and take them directly to Ace Chemicals. The boss wants the new formula cooking by the end of the day, she tells them. One of the clowns turns to her, asking sheepishly if they're going to have security. You're the security, she tells him simply. It's just, we gotta pass through the Narrows to get to Ace. Clowns don't do so hot in the Narrows right now, he explains quickly. Punchline moves forward, wrapping her arm around his throat, twisting behind him the blade of her knife pushing against his throat. Talk fast, make me care. Fear fills his eyes as he tells her that there are 12 of their clowns that were killed in the Narrows last night. Bats don't kill! She tells him, narrowing her eyes. This wasn't the bat. This was something weirder, he explains. Last night, two of the clowns were trapped in their repurposed Batmobile. The accelerator was floored and nothing was happening. A voice calls out from the hood of that car. Uh, hi. Uh, yeah, so those controls don't work so well anymore. I wasn't sure if I could short circuit one of your fancy cars, but it looks like I just needed a transformer and a fire hydrant, the strange teenager tells them. The clown laughs, telling him that he'll never get inside of the Batmobile. Well, I don't really care to get in. It's gonna be hot in there. I got my anti-clown toxin right here. I bought it down at the gas station, the teen tells them, beginning to pour gasoline into the crack on the windshield. The kid steps down, walking away as the clowns all begin to burn. I'm the clown hunter? Sorry, that sucks for you, I know. The clown finishes his story, telling them that the clown hunter killed the clowns. Punchline pulls him in close, telling him she doesn't care if he goes around the narrows, but the canister will be delivered tonight. You need to decide who you're really afraid of, some kid or the guy who's about to kill the Batman, she tells him as she walks away. Meanwhile, elsewhere in Gotham City. You've never been one to look failure in the face, have you, bats? Joker asks as a reanimated corpse begins to surround the Dark Knight. The maniac laughs as Batman prepares for a fight, asking who he thinks is angrier. The older corpses, or the newer ones since they were killed because Batman let me live for so long. I guess, you know what, it really doesn't matter. They're all angry, all disappointed. They all want you dead, Batman. <laughs> Joker laughs on the radio. The corpses are launched into an attack, with Batman leaping over them trying to fight back. But the dead are everywhere, dragging him down, piling on top of him, holding him back. But the Joker, he keeps talking, telling Batman that he can't wait until the rest of the city shows up for the next showing of Zorro. How they'll learn the truth before they die and then become angry with Batman as well. Don't listen to him, Master Bruce. Keep your focus. The voice of Alfred tells him over the comms, and Batman throws another punch. I'm trying, Alfred. Punchline's toxin is too strong. It's twisting the reality around me. Batman snaps. The corpses begin to morph, shifting into Batman's perception, when suddenly he's surrounded by jokers, just tons of jokers, their lips twisted into smiles as they claw at him. Listen to my voice. Keep yourself grounded, Alfred tells him. You're not real either. Batman breathes. He knows he's losing his grip on reality. He knows that he needs to stop the Joker's voice. He pulls free a launcher, firing a battering into the projector booth. 
The Joker keeps laughing, asking if Batman thinks any of the ones that might survive the movie will come back to get him. The Joker's corpses keep piling on as the Batarang counts down until finally it explodes, cutting off the Joker's words. I said shut up! Batman screams as he throws the Joker corpses aside. The toxin is too much. He can't trust his eyes. So he rips off a piece of his cape, tying it around his head. I don't need them to fight. A good bat knows how to fight blind, he tells Alfred. Batman leaps into the battle, his punches connecting, lashing out with his kicks, throwing the undead left and right. But Alfred cuts back in, telling Batman that there are too many. He won't survive. I don't need to. I just need to get to the center of the battlefield, he tells the man, and as he raises an EMP emitter over his head, he uses it to short the nanomachines that are reanimating the dead. Alfred goes quiet with Batman struggling out of the theater, his breath labored as he pushes through the burning hallway. The metal door to the alleyway bangs open, revealing a ghostly scene to the dark night. Ah, Bruce, be careful. You'll put an eye out, Thomas tells his young son as he acts like Zorro. Thomas, are you sure this shortcut is safe? Martha asks, taking her husband's hand. No, no, turn back! Batman screams at his own origin, but his strength leaves him as he falls to the alleyway floor. Through the mists and the shadows, a figure is slowly approaching, and Harley Quinn sighs, lowering her weapon as she looks down at Batman. Oh, brother, here we go again. At his new penthouse, the Joker laughs as he drinks from his bottle of champagne. You know, I never thought I'd have a taste for the finer things, he tells her. They look down at the destruction on the city below them, and the woman tells him that Batman is still out there. The Joker nods, telling her that that is how the game is played. I make my move, he makes his, it happens in turns. I was too hopeful that the delightful toxin of yours would make a play right now. Punchline nods, telling the man about the kid known as the Clown Killer. And the Joker's smile grows even wider. Isn't that wonderful? Punchline is confused, but the Joker explains that that means as someone has realized that the rule book has been thrown out. So we just let him keep killing our people? She asks, but the Joker shakes his head. Oh no! Send in some of our heavy hitters! Crucify him on the street! Let people know that we won't stand for that kind of thing! And then, I think it's time that I douse my former flame! About freaking time! Punchline gasps with joy. Batman begins to awaken on a bed of flowers with something licking his face and he calls for Ace. Yes, it's me! Ace the Bat Hound! Harley laughs, speaking through her strange puppet. He sits up, seeing her sitting before him. <laughs> Sorry, Bats. We gotta stop meeting like this. People are gonna say that we're in love, she tells him with a giant smile. Batman looks around, questioning where they are as he surveys the vast, strange forest. And Harley explains that this is Eden, a place that Ivy created for her underneath the Gotham Park, a place where she could get over the Joker. Ivy's usual rules that there are no clothes in Eden, but I didn't think that you and I had that kind of a relationship, Harley admits, holding up a steaming cup, telling Batman that he needs to drink it. He peers into it suspiciously, and Harley tells him that it'll negate the effects of the toxins from Punchline in his system. Flush out all those bad chemicals out of your system, she tells him. Batman finally swallows the liquid, and then he immediately gasps as he looks at Harley. The woman's head snaps and hangs there as she stares at him. Hey, nice! That means it's working! Now you'll be out for a few hours. You're gonna trip balls first, but it'll flush all that nasty stuff out of your system. See you in a bit, she tells him as she runs off. The garden disappears, and Batman is in darkness as bats are flapping all around him. This isn't real. This isn't real. When suddenly a voice speaks to him in the dark. I know, boy, but I'm very sorry, Master Bruce, but I think it's time we had a serious talk. The dead Alfred tells him as he turns him around. The Joker's men have taken over the city, using advanced weapons and fear to terrorize the people. The police are spread thin. Meanwhile, over at Holy Cross Cemetery, Batwoman revs the engine on her motorcycle, launching across the open ground, leaping off of it. And in seconds, she is among the Joker's soldiers fighting to save lives. It's Batwoman! Shoot it down! The clown yells, momentarily stopping his mortar barrage. And the tree line, Detector Bullock, leans out shotgun in hand. Something's up. The mortars went quiet. He hisses to his men. I heard a motorcycle engine and then a lot of small arms blasting in there. We need to move before they zero in on us again, he orders the men. The police begin to charge across the cemetery, using the gravestones as cover. Harvey stops, peeking out to see Batwoman fighting amongst the clowns. So he decides to charge in, rushing headlong for the top of the hill. Come on, let's get in there! We ain't paid to watch! He shouts, leading his men forward. 
Batwoman continues to fight, not giving the clowns any quarter as Bullock and his men charge the hill. Blast anyone without a cape! Bullock orders as he opens fire. Batwoman turns, her fists smashing into the face of another clown, hard enough to knock his mask off and a few teeth with it. Meanwhile, over at Wayne Enterprises, another clown enters the room, ordering Lucius Fox to increase the output. Fox turns, his face twisted into a hideous smile as he nods, crossing the room. He reaches for a lever, but the clown cracks him in the back of the head with his pistol. What are you doing? He demands, putting the gun to Lucius' head. The switch you were about to pull was the assembly line shutdown. You better get your head on straight, Fox, or I'm going to blow it clean the hell off. The clown yells. Lucius nods, pushing the button to increase the output on the drones. The speakers crackle, and the Joker's voice blares out for his men to hear. <laughs> Attention, all drone squadrons and strange units. We are at DEFCON 1. <laughs> Initiate attack. And hey, let's have some fun out there. He cackles. Throughout the city, the Joker's soldiers are roaring into action, and overhead, the Joker drones wheel and dive back towards the streets below. Meanwhile, in the cemetery, Batwoman and the police continue to fight. These clowns are reeling, but we're all scattered, Bullock. All the rest of you, form a battle square and keep them out of our perimeter, she orders. Some of the cops begin to argue, but Bullock turns at yelling at them. Shut up! She pulled your fat out of the fire when these clowns had us pinned down. Now get into position, he orders. Suddenly, the sound of an approaching drone is overhead. Bullock stands next to Batwoman, looking up into the sky. It's about time the bad cavalry arrived. Bullock nods, but Batwoman isn't so sure. I got some bad news for you, Bullock. That's not one of ours. The Droker drone opens fire, rounds pounding into the dirt around them, so Bullock and Batwoman yell for everyone to get down as the drone wheels around for another pass. Good! The closer the better! Batman shouts from the top of one of the mausoleums. He shoulders a weapon, firing at the approaching drone. The EMP route hits it, shorting it out and dropping it from the sky. Spread out! The EMP emitter can only short out one of their drones at a time! He yells at everyone, but another drone dives in, knocking the Dark Knight out of his perch. The cops then turn, opening fire, blowing up the drone. Batwoman comes over, helping Batman back to his feet as Bullock joins them. As much as I hate to say it, thanks for the save, Bats. He growls. Batman nods, ordering Bullock and Batwoman to get the wounded to the hospital. But Batwoman shakes her head, reminding the Dark Knight that there's going to be a lot more wounded if they don't take out the weapons printer at Wayne Enterprises. We have to shut down these weapons at the source, and you're in no shape to go alone. She tells him. Batman nods, and Batwoman asks him for his plan. Knowing you, I'm sure you've got some secret contingency plan for something like this. As a matter of fact, I do. He tells her. Meanwhile, over at Wayne Enterprises, one of the clowns puts a gun to Lucius' head, asking him what the alarms are for. <laughs> Seems like something's coming from the sub-level. Something big. He giggles. The room begins to rumble as the clowns order everyone to stay at their posts. Suddenly, the walls explode inward and Batman rolls in on his tank. Targeting systems engaged, he tells Kate Kane over the radio. I thought that guns weren't your thing, she asks him as she gets into the mounted weapon. That's a stun a minute, Batwoman. Now let's do what we came here to do. Works for me, she shouts as she opens fire with the mounted stun emitter. Rounds begin to ping off the tank's armor as Batman rumbles through the building. Batwoman swivels the weapon, firing stun rounds across the gathering of clown soldiers. Batman then swivels the sonic concussion cannon, launching a round at the weapon's printer to implode it, destroying the machine while the concussive blast knocks the clowns aside. Batman scans the room, discovering Lucius is held hostage in the upper floor. Uploading the specs to your cal, Batman tells Batwoman. Get Fox to safety. I'll take care of the rest of the drones, she orders. Batwoman launches into the air, making for Lucius Fox. Please don't make this your lexicon, she mutters. She kicks the clown off of Lucius Fox before putting her hand gently on his shoulder. How about we get you out of here, Mr. Fox? She whispers. <laughs> I, I like that idea, thanks. <laughs> He says softly. With the two last drones destroyed, Batwoman drops back onto the tank. Batman exits, seeing Lucius in the last stages of the Joker toxin before he dies. So he administers the antitoxin that slows the effects. Fox continues to giggle, telling Bruce that he did what he could to slow the Joker's men down. You did pretty good, old friend. Hang out, he tells Lucius. He lowers the man to the ground as Batwoman goes to retrieve her bike. I'm heading out. Scanners are picking up trouble at Valari Gardens, she tells Bruce. Keep me updated on your position. Please, Batman asks her. With the war still waging at Gotham, the Joker needs to be put down. Hard. We're in complete agreement on that. War is hell, Batman. On everyone and everything. You do what you have to do, and I'll do what I have to do. She tells him before roaring off into the night.
Late in the prodigal bar one night, Rick and Beatrice sit at a table with Beatrice stating that she's getting more and more worried. His headaches are getting worse. They're almost debilitating. He needs to get help. Rick tells her, yeah, it's hard for him to shop for a doctor when the last one betrayed him. Besides, all he needs is her right now. He can sort out his head pain, his memories, everything with her help. She says that she'll do what she can, but they still need to find someone who can. But before she could finish, sirens can be heard and Rick Grayson says that he has to go. Beatrice tells him to ignore it. He can't be a hero to everyone. It's time that he takes care of himself. So he gets up telling her that he agrees after he makes sure that everyone is okay. He runs out of the bar and Beatrice sighs, asking what is she going to do with him? But at that moment, a voice tells her that the real question is, what am I going to do with you? As a man steps down from the second floor, Beatrice notices the outfit and quietly curses to herself. Meanwhile, a block away, the supervillain Tusk slams an officer into the ground, stating that he should have known better. No matter what they do, there's no going back. Another officer calls out that they have him surrounded. All of the escapees are accounted for except for him. A third officer yells that he's cleaning up after the power outages, and that means that his cell is waiting. Freak! Tusk begins to growl, throwing the officer that he was holding at the other, shouting, Don't call me that! The second officer picks up his gun, and he points it at Tusk's head, telling him that if he moves a single inch, but then again, that would just allow him to put him out of his ugly-ass misery. Tusk spins back with his arm, smacking the officer, telling him that he doesn't know a thing about misery, but he will. But before Tusk could squeeze the officer's head, Rick jumps in, kicking Tusk back, thinking to himself that this all seems familiar. Must have seen him before, but it's hard to tell with these messed up memories. Tusk skids back, asking who is he, and Risk says that he's just a guy looking to help. As the two begin to engage, Rick thinks that all of this is familiar. Has he met him before, or does he just know about him? Tusk quickly grabs Rick by the neck, slamming him down into a car, telling him, You should have stayed home! Would have saved you from what's coming next! Rick then jams one of his batons into Tusk's eyes, and in a fit of rage, Tusk smacks Rick away, shouting, KILL YOU! But as Rick slams into a car, he notices a metal card lodged into the tire. The card of the Joker. Rick stares at that Joker card, asking, Is he involved? Wait, have we met? Have we fought? The whole world knows that the Joker is a killing machine, and if he is behind this, Rick takes the metal card, throwing it at Tusk, slicing through his face and his eyes. Tusk growls as blood pours out of his face, shouting, Gotta tear you in two, little man! Rick runs up, kicking Tusk, telling him, You already tried that! Didn't work! He goes on to beat Tusk with his batons, all the while thinking, How is the Joker involved in this? Was it all a distraction, and if so, for who? Oh no. Meanwhile, back at the bar, Beatrice asks the Shatterbury man who he is, and he replies with, A FRIEND! Beatrice then begins to ask, how does he? But the man finishes her question, asking, you Know about Rick Dick Richard Robin Nightwing? My dear Beatrice, I am an expert in all things Batman! As the Joker walks down the stairs with his trusty crowbar, Beatrice realizes who this is. You're... And the Joker tells her, yes, the one, the only, Joker! <laughs> Note the photos, autographs, and personal appearances must be arranged through my agent Slappy. May he rest in peace. But at that moment, Rick jumps in yelling to Beatrice, run! And Joker turns around. Why if it isn't Rick Dick Richard Robin Nightwing? How very night of you to join us. As Rick rushes in, Joker hits him in the back with his elbow, asking, Why does everything have to be a fight with you? I simply came here to offer some help. I know all about him. Rick gets back up, telling him, That's not possible. I'm not Nightwing anymore. That torn costume around your neck? What did you do to Sap? Joker laughs, telling him, You should be thanking me for dealing with that imposter, stealing your good name. But still, I am here to help. I can tell you all about your mommy and your daddy, and the splendid, ferocious trapeze act. Not to mention the nasty Zuko fellow that did them in, and that overly serious, terribly damaged Wayne fellow who took you in. Rick steps back asking, how do you? And Joker tells him, I've always known, and I can help you remember. Rick shouts, never, I'm fine. And Joker tells him, you are so not 
fine, dick! Beatrice runs up, swinging her bat, yelling, he is fine! But the Joker deflects it with his crowbar, telling her, you are one very unfriendly bartender. Probably makes a terrible drink, too. As Rick gets ready to charge in, Joker tells him to freeze. Indulge me in a little conversation, and Snuggles here lives. Rick stops what he was doing as Joker leans on the bar, telling him, You finally came to the realization that this long, fabulous, all-night party of ours must end. The Talon, the Owls, those ghastly memories they forced into your head. I can take them away. You can be free. Free to be Mr. Richard Grayson. Rick shouts that it's bull, but Joker pulls out a crystal thing, telling him that the shrewd doctor was a memory vampire. He can use her own silver bullet to wipe away her influence forever. Rick lunges for the memory crystal, yelling for him to give it to him. But the crystal begins to shine, and the Joker tells him, Oh, I'll give it to you, all right? Rick suddenly stops at his tracks, and the Joker smiles, telling him that that certainly calmed him down. Perhaps they can find a common ground, a meeting of the minds, as they say. Now, what is your name? Rick stops. Rick. And Joker says, Yuck! No one likes that name. How about Dicky Boy? Rick stops. Hi, I'm Dicky Boy. Joker laughs. <laughs> Excellent! Now, how about I talk and you listen? Rick stares into the crystal and says, You talk, I listen. And the Joker's grin grows wider as he tells him, Good. Let me tell you about a little boy whose parents died in the circus. That their deaths didn't make him a sad little boy. He was thrilled because a very nice man with green hair and white skin came to take that boy in and raise him as his own. Allow me to tell you about your life. The next night, Beatrice heads to Gotham, and she begins to pick up and place sticks down in a certain pattern, and when she's finished, she pours on some fuel and lights it up. As she stands back, that fire spreads, and on the ground, the bat symbol lights up. And a few moments later, Batgirl looks out, seeing that it was Beatrice who lit the fire, and that if she is the one calling for help, something's wrong with Dick Grayson. Beatrice only knows her as Barbara, so a short while later, Batgirl steps out stating that bonfires aren't allowed in the park, you know. Beatrice looks back, somewhat disappointed, stating that she was hoping to attract someone more official. But Batgirl thinks that she's referring to Batman, and Dick obviously told her a lot about maybe everything. Does she know her identity? Beatrice goes on, stating that she needs help. Special help for Rick. She knows who he was and all that stuff. Batgirl tells her that... She should know that they are quite capable, then what's wrong? Beatrice tells her that she's not entirely sure. It all started this morning. Last night, Joker showed up at the bar. He knocked her out, and he was getting ready to kill Rick. When she opened up her eyes, Rick was standing there smiling. He said that he'd kicked the Joker's butt and sent him home crying, but it all seemed too easy. Rick knocked him out with one punch, and then he broke the memory crystal, ripping it right off of the Joker's neck. But his attitude was so different. He wanted to make pancakes all of a sudden. And when she asked if he was okay, he shouted that he was fine and then acted like nothing had happened. It was all so weird. And after that, he bolted to Gotham. Now she knows that he was Nightwing and she's praying that Batman or Batgirl or someone here can help him. Batgirl walks off telling her to have some faith. Whatever Rick needs, she'll make damn sure that he gets it. So later that night, she begins to head out thinking to herself that she knew that she should have stayed closer to Dick. She should have never let him stay alone in Bloodhaven. She then reaches into her backpack, pulling out the Nightwing costume, when suddenly a voice calls out asking, Hey, looking for Nightwing? Batgirl says, yeah, sure, and Dick runs up, picking her up, but she pushes him back, stating, Is she talking to Rick or Dick? Dick tells her that his name is Ferdinand, of course. And after an awkward pause, Dick bursts out laughing, telling her, Psych! And Batgirl tells him that it's enough. It's time for him to come back home, to be himself again. And Dick takes the costume, stating that he is himself. He's exactly himself. That really, really, really awesomely true him. Batgirl tells him that she doesn't understand what happened to him, but she can tell that there's something really wrong. Just let Bruce and her help. At that moment, a voice asks, Did someone say something was wrong? As in, not right? What does it matter when you're dead? Punchline jumps in with Batgirl asking, Who is she? Punchline tells her the essence of any great joke, of course, the punchline. Punchline then kicks and Batgirl dodges, telling her, great, another Harley wannabe, not impressed. So Punchline pulls out her knife, swinging, asking, do you think I'm like her? I left Harley drowning in a pool of her own blood. Batgirl tells her that that is unlikely, but Punchline slashes and cuts into Batgirl's leg and begins to maniacally laugh. 
As Punchline brings the knife to Batgirl's neck, Rick says, Make like a statue, Punchy! And Batgirl lets out a sigh of relief, stating, Finally. Rick rushes forward, grabbing Punchline by the arm, and she asks, What are you doing? Rick tells him, Stopping it, you! Because we had a deal! Punchline smiles, stating, Right, I'd forgotten. She takes the blood from her finger, tracing it along Rick's mouth, and he smiles, stating, Batgirl is mine to kill! Batgirl stares in disbelief and begins to slowly back up thinking that the crystal that Beatrice mentioned, it wasn't destroyed. The Joker used it, turned Dick into his. But before she could get away, Rick yanks on Batgirl's cape, yelling that takeoffs are not allowed and knocks her out. Punchline walks over stating that he hurt her. That'll make the J-Man so very happy. From around the corner, Joker walks out asking, Happy? I'm smiling, aren't I? That means I'm deliciously happy, outrageously happy, happy enough to kill. What a shame that Bruce, deary weary dreary Bruce, isn't here to see this. If he were, he'd pull out the old bat phone and snap a pic of the family. My family. Batgirl awakens, her hands tied behind her back, tying her to a pole in the center of a caged ring. The lights suddenly flash on, blinding her for a brief moment before she sees the army of clowns that surround her. The clowns are all shouting insults, jeering at her, and they begin to chant, Fight! 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 Dick Grayson leaps off the rooftops of Gotham City. He loves fight night. The blood always reminds him of his parents' death. Drunks, druggies, child beaters, those lousy trapeze artists made his life a living hell. Luckily, he was freed, taken in by the one man who cared for him. His guide, his mentor, his father took him in, taught him to take care of himself, to fight, even the likes of Batman. He lands on the rooftop adjacent to the cage fight. About time, you ready to get down and dirty? Punchline calls out from behind him, and Dick nods and smiles. And the woman raps on the door, with the metal flying open, revealing the Joker. Ladies and gentlemen, it's time to rumble! As the master of ceremonies, I want to welcome you to Fight Night. He calls out to the crowd. In this quarter, direct from the hello that is Gotham City, Bad Girl! He calls out, bringing on booze from the clown crowd. And in this corner, the champion, the man who can't be beat. He who can kill it with a one-liner or a knife in the back. My boy, Dickie boy. Dickie boy, Dickie boy, Dickie boy. The clowns all begin to chant. Place thine bets and get thee ready to rocketh. The Joker yells as Dick leaps into the ring and the bell is rung and Dick pulls out as a scrimmage sticks. Greatest sound in the world except for breaking bones. <laughs> he laughs, rushing forward, but Batgirl twists, kicking him hard in the chin. She then twists her hands, using the razor epaulets to cut through the ropes. She squares off, preparing for Grayson, who twists and attacks. You telegraph that move. Proves you're compromised, she tells him, but he laughs. <laughs> yeah, I telegraphed that, so I can set you up for this. He snaps, cracking her in the chin with his escrima. Outside of the ring, Joker wipes a tear from his eye, proud of his dicky boy. He turns to Punchline, telling her how he knows all of the Bat family, how he means more to them than they mean to each other. Dick leaps at Barbara, preparing to strike again, but she manages to backflip away, still trying to talk him out of his hypnosis. Punchline looks at Joker. Ta-ta, demolition time. You remember the servant, right? The preposterous tribute that they built in your name? The Joker laughs, remembering the dead butler. Go, do the place. He tells her with a wicked grin. Meanwhile, in the ring, Dick hits Batgirl with a series of blows that leave her staggered, telling her that the Bat family will no longer persecute them. Time for you to pay, he tells her. But she snaps out of it, uppercutting him hard. Listen to me! She's trying to get through to Dick Grayson. This isn't him. He shouldn't be working for Joker. Listen to my voice. Let it sink in, and until it jogs something, try to remind you of who you were, she tells him, chasing him as he tries to dodge away. You are not Dicky Boy. You are not rich. You're not some anonymous guy in an action suit. Your name is Dick, and you were the best, the first Robin. You built the Teen Titans into an enduring force. Look at that suit! These days, you're Nightwing. A bullet tore through the side of your head and almost killed you. And ever since then, you've been victimized by people who tried to warp your mind and control you. Don't let them. Be the man that you really are. Barbara yells at Dick, trying to get through to him. He pauses, leaning back, staring at her as she delivers her speech. 
Meanwhile, at Alfred Pennyworth's Children Hospital, Punchline congratulates the clowns on what they've done in the electrical room. She pulls out Batgirl's comm unit. Guys, it's me! I need help! The Joker! He's at the Children's Hospital with a bomb that- Oh, oh my god, no, don't! She screams, getting the Bat family's attention. Batgirl, on my way! Drake out! Drake yells in reply. At the fight, Dick Grayson is stopped, telling Barbara that he finally knows who he is. But he suddenly whirls around, throwing a punch that she barely dodges. That means the gloves are off. She tells him, cracking him in the face with his scrimmage stick. Yeah, kinda figured this would happen. Ah well, the butler's place is still going to blow. Joker sighs, watching the outcome. Barbara is shocked to hear the Joker mention the children's hospital. Realizing that she can't get through to him, Barbara leaps out and over the cage. She knows that she has to save the children. Coward! Dick yells, beginning to give chase. But the Joker tells him to stop, wrapping his arms around the young boy. You're playing the game all wrong, me boy! I can set you up for even more success, where you can get three kills for the price of one! And a grin spreads over Dick Grayson's face. Tell me more. Several blocks from the hospital, Tim Drake lands in the alleyway. Drake, you heard Batgirl's call too? Red Hood asks. Drake nods, telling his brother that they need to save Batgirl. Something about that call seemed off. Almost like, Jason begins. Like it could be a setup? Dickie Boy asks, landing next to them. Trust me, it is. Orchestrated by the Joker himself, he tells the others. Jason and Tim ask if Dick finally has his memories back. Yeah, and Barbara's been brainwashed by the clown. She's out to bomb the hospital, Dick tells them, a small smile still on his face. Guys, we have to stop her, no matter the price. As the sirens go off, B thinks to herself the same thing that she's always thought about Gotham. She hates it, but if she could, at the very least, she wants to help Rick, Rick Grayson the person that she's been helping try to get back his memories. And she's decided that that's what she's going to do. Barbara was supposed to take care of things, but she hasn't been heard of for a while. And now she's just chasing down sirens and... Wait, what's that? Out of the alleyway, B sees Rick with Drake and Red Hood surrounded by clowns. Red Hood says that they're going to have to cut their way to get to the hospital and deactivate the bomb. And Dick tells him, yeah, bomb, like boom time, kitty body strewn into the rubble. Red Hood pauses for a moment listening, and then he looks back at Dick, and he notices that his clothes seem familiar. A grin spreads over Dicky Boy's face, and he says that he's kind of offended. It took him this long to figure it out, that he was the one fighting against Red Hood. Dicky Boy grabs Drake by the neck, punching him, and then he kicks his leg back, cracking Red Hood in the face. Drake and Red Hood begin to pick themselves up, and Dicky Boy says, I was wearing a mask earlier. But now it's time to get out the toy box. And as for the name, you guys can call me Dicky Boy. As a pair of clowns grab Drake, Drake says, this is twisted. Nightwing is, and Red Hood fights his group telling him, I know, he's working for the clowns. Dicky Boy bashes Red Hood in the side of the head telling him, no, I don't work with them. I'm the boss's kid. So that makes me management. Red Hood reaches for his gun telling Drake, hurry up inside and take care of the bomb. I'll handle him. Drake vaults over the clowns, telling him, Remember, Nightwing is family. Don't hurt him, Jason. Red Hood gets up, stating, That's completely up to him. But if he steps over that line... A couple of clowns close in, and Dicky Boy gets in first, telling him, This one's on me, guys. As Dicky Boy hits Red Hood over and over, he says, This is like Little Red Riding Hood. They said the role of the big bad wolf is played by myself. And naturally, this time, the wolf is going to win. But up on the rooftop, the Joker bursts out laughing, telling him, <laughs> Isn't this amazing? Our Dicky Boy has a chance to finish what he started all those years ago by snuffing out Jason Todd for good. But just then, Batgirl swings in, kicking both Joker and Punchline, telling them, If we're going to talk about finishers, can we start with yours? Joker gets up, telling him, I should have walked you off the roof when I had a chance. But Batgirl crashes down on him, telling him, I should have aimed that rod at your heart. Batgirl scoops up the crystal, jumping down the ledge, yelling that they will not be controlling Nightwing anymore. Down on the ground, two clowns high-five as Red Hood lays on the ground, and Dicky Boy reaches for a gun. Red Hood slowly gets back up, telling him, You might have a gun, but you don't have the stones to pull the trigger, Dick. Dicky Boy fires two shots at Red Hood's feet, and he asks, Oh, I don't? The gun is aimed a little bit higher, and Dicky Boy asks, Which eye, Red Hood? Right or left? Batgirl kicks him in the back of the head, telling him, how about neither? 
Dicky Boy then kicks her off, asking, Again? Can't you see I'm not interested? The gun gets turned to Batgirl, but Batgirl tells him, You wouldn't. Dicky Boy cocks the gun. Hell, I won't. It's in my jeans. Up at the rooftop, the Joker yells, asking, Did you hear that? Dicky Boy is stepping up to take charge of the old family business. Do it. Pull that trigger. Dicky Boy gets ready to squeeze down, and Batgirl tells him, Think for a moment. You aren't what that sadistic psycho did to you. This isn't you. You can't do this. Dicky Boy begins to struggle with the gun, but before he can pull the trigger, B runs in, picking up the crystal, yelling, You're not that maniac's son! You don't have to take orders from guys like him. You stop them. You've been abused for too long. You've been used by people who have weaponized this crystal for their own gains. It turns you into Dicky Boy, into a Talon, and even Rick Grayson, but those identities are all lies. You are the best, most honorable man that I have ever known, and I love you for it, Rick. The time has finally gone for the real Richard Grayson to come back. Dicky Boy shouts in pain as his head pounds, snatching for the crystal from B. And B tells him, Take it! Make it yours! But in Nightwing's head, he begins to see everything. How he was manipulated from the very beginning. From the moment that KG Beast shot him. First, Isabella Haas. She was the doctor in charge of his recovery. But in reality, she was a member of the Court of the Owls. More memories come flooding back in. All the people that he has met along the way. All telling him the same thing. That he is a good man. A man that is dedicated to justice. B tells him he knows it all to be true. He knows exactly who he is. And it's time for Dick Grayson to come home. Dicky Boy looks at the crystal, throwing it to the ground. B asks, Rick? Dicky Boy stomps on the crystal, telling her, Not Rick. Dick Grayson's home. A voice says that he's back again. And Batman swings down. B watches as the Bat family welcomes back their own as she wonders, Does he even remember his time with her? Just then, Drake runs out yelling, it was purple. I picked that one because I figured that's what the Joker would have done. And I was right. The bomb's disarmed. Soon, everyone begins to look around asking, where is B? And over in the alleyway, the love of Rick Grayson's life walks away, crying, telling herself that she hates Gotham. She always has. And now there's one more thing that she's going to hate about it. It's taken Rick Grayson away from her. And that concludes the Dick Grayson arc. He is now back to being Nightwing, but if you want to know what happens, keep watching this video because he's going to join Batman to wrap up the Joker War. As the coolness of the Iceberg Lounge sets in, Scarecrow tells Riddler that he's afraid. Riddler stares at the chessboard, telling him that he isn't afraid, he's just thinking. Scarecrow looks up and tells him, that's right, thinking of all the ways you're going to fail. That's what you always do. Riddler asks, what is he even talking about? They're playing chess, and Scarecrow tells him, No, you're not playing chess, you're playing him! As Riddler lunges over the table, grabbing Scarecrow by the neck, Penguin says that that was predictable. We should have all taken bets on how quickly Eddie would have flipped the board. Catwoman watches the news about Joker's rampage, stating that this is all her fault. She was the one who gave him the money. Has there been any sight of him? Penguin tells her no. The bat appears to have been taken off of the table. Catwoman's eyes stay fixated on the TV, and she quietly says, Come on now, bat. Pull yourself together. The city's in pain, and it's calling out to you. Meanwhile, over in Ivy's Forest of Eden, Batman lays on his back, dreaming of Alfred, stating, T sounds nice. Harley goes to dampen the cloth that she's been using to keep Batman's temperature down, telling him, Hell no. You've had enough tea. You're probably seeing the whole singing and dancing number right now. Batman the musical on ice! But right now, you're gonna need to get your pointy-eared butt together. Batman groans, telling her, The kitchen. And she yells, Great! Now he's got the munchies! God help us! Just then a voice calls out, Do you ever shut up? Should have made that cut a little deeper. Harley hears a distant voice asking, Pammy? But through the brush, Punchline steps out stating, you really should have picked somewhere else to hide out that isn't so flammable. Harley snaps back, shouting, Punching bag? Or, I mean, punchline? Is that a flamethrower? Inside Batman's head, he gets ready to sit up in the parlor with Alfred asking if he can see it. If he sees which tea this is. Batman tells him that it's the jarring blend. The one from the cupboard to the left of the pantry. The tea that is only brought out when he's most disturbed and frightened. Batman goes on recapping the entire situation that the Joker has the Wayne Foundation's money. He's keeping the gangs in the street, terrorizing the people and killing them. Because Joker knows that Batman is his opposite. That there is no difference from him taking one life or a million lives. 
but there is to Batman. Back in Eden, there's a loud whoosh as Punchline pours the flames open and Harley scrambles to pick Batman up. She huffs, lifting him, asking, How are you so heavy? You jump off roofs for God's sakes! Throwing him to the side, Punchline shouts that Batman isn't going to save her now. The toxin running through his system will take days of agony to clear. And by then, there won't be any city left to save. Stop hiding behind a failed hero, Harley Quinn! Harley grabs her rifle, opening fire, yelling back, Fine! I'll just have to hide behind the big freaking gun! After shooting the flamethrower's tank, Harley drops the gun, stating, Cutting my throat was one thing, but coming down to burn the only place in the city that I love? Just how did the Joker twist you up so much? Punchline tells her that she doesn't understand anything. You never have, and now it's time to end things. Harley picks up her bat, telling her, Oh, I went soft to you last time, but this time around, I'm not gonna be holding back. Punchline blocks Harley's attacks, telling her that she thinks she's somebody because she had some idiotic coming to God moment. Harley pushes into the bat, telling her, You have no idea what you're talking about. And Punchline laughs, shouting, Of course I do! Everyone knows how pathetic Harley Quinn is! Punchline then kicks Harley in the stomach, knocking her across the forest as she gets up asking, Who the hell do you think you are? Punchline tells her that she was in school when the world was falling apart while everyone was pretending that it wasn't. That's when she heard him speak. Took her a while to join his cause, even longer for him to see that she was serious. She'll be by his side when he finally kills the bat and they will take this war from city to city until everyone has heard the Joker's message. Harley picks herself back up, telling Punchline, You know what? I feel sorry for you, kid. You still don't know that we're exactly the same. I thought Mr. J had a heart. You think he has a brain. He's a manipulator, and he's manipulating you. Punchline tells her that she doesn't get it. She wants everyone to be as stupid as she is. Harley lunges, punching Punchline. And as Punchline swings, Harley ducks and kicks her in the face. Harley then jumps on top and begins to punch Punchline over and over, telling her, I feel sorry for you, but not enough not to beat you down. There's nothing in this world that Joker is going to care about more than the Batman. Punchline cracks back, telling her, and that's when you're wrong. Just watch after Batman dies by my hands. Back inside Batman's head, Alfred tells Batman that he takes himself so seriously. There's a weight to the promise that he made as a boy. It would crush any other man, and it's nearly crushing him. And since he lost him, it's come to the closest. Batman hangs his head. I'm sorry. But Alfred tells him no, he has to listen. Batman spent too much time trying to save Alfred's life, and he can't accept what happened. He holds it against everyone. He's made them all helpless. But he is Batman, and he needs to accept the world that he lives in. Accept what he can control. And in doing so, he can save the lives of so many people in the city that he loves so much. Every life that he saves is a victory against death. Against the Joker, Mr. Wayne. Batman struggles to find his words and says that he doesn't think he can do this alone. And Alfred tells him, then don't. Find the family. Find that love. Take back the city. Be the impossible man who saves all the families on their way home from the theater. And Batman tells him, but if I wake up, your voice will be gone. And Alfred lifts Batman's chin, telling him, what you're doing is you're doing without me. I am only a voice in your head. You don't need me on the other end of the Bat computer to know exactly what it tell you to do in any circumstance. Back in the forest, Batman gasps, waking up and Punchline is surprised, asking how, and Batman responds, leaping into the air, telling her, I'm Batman! As Batman takes Punchline down, Harley says that it's about damn time he did that. She had this whole sad sack story, and if she had to listen to it for one minute longer, she would have ended her herself. But, uh, you got your head on straight now? Batman says, that depends. And Harley tells him, well, the whole place is on fire. She burned it up. And Batman says, then yeah, my head is on straight. After pulling out a small device, he tells the computer that he needs the location of the family. The computer asks which family members, and Batman smiles. I need everyone. Meanwhile, over in the lounge, Catwoman says that she's leaving, and Penguin says that he believes that he told her that's already impossible. She says that it won't be. He's coming with her, and so is the Riddler. Penguin asks why on earth would she want to recruit them into the super heroics during a Joker attack of all things. And Catwoman then turns asking him, what if I told you I could make you a billionaire? Back in the city, the Joker laughs to himself as he brings his briefcase into the parking lot and his driver tells him that it has been made to his exact specifications. The Joker says that he knows. That's why I'm laughing. <laughs> this limo is the most ludicrous thing that I've ever seen. And it's 
Perfect! Now take me to Ace Chemical. Go the long way around. As the driver pulls into the burning city, the Joker asks, Isn't it nice seeing the city wake up like this? It feels like it's been pretending to be something that is not for such a long time. Remember the grit on the street walking home? Not sure if you're going to be mugged by a robber or a cop. The only difference was their uniform. You know, he tried to change that. Tried to root out the corruption, make everyone believe in something selfish and strange. A child's fantasy of justice infecting this city. Stripped the dark life and danger from it and made it into a cartoon show. And the bat never saw the truth. He never saw Gotham's festering, rotting, hungry face. Desperate to swallow you whole. He thinks that it's his city. He bought his way into giving the city a mass delusion to make it forget what it is. Gotham doesn't care about good or bad. It just doesn't want to be bound by anyone's rules. It just wants to be free. It wants to hurt people. It wants to be dangerous again. And that's what this is all about. It's getting the ball rolling. It's making this all a bit more dangerous again. As the Joker pulls up to the Ace Chemicals factory, his phone rings and as he answers it, he says he was beginning to think that she was dead. He shoots his driver and Punchline asks what was that and the Joker says, Oh, nothing important, just cleaning up a mess. How'd your meeting go? Punchline scoffs, telling him, poorly. They got the one up on me when Batman was supposed to be down for the count. They tied me up and left me for the cops, but our boys got here first. But that also means that he's been out there and working for a few hours. Joker walks into the plant, shooting the rest of the clowns inside, telling her, That just means that we're ready for the final act. The streets are in chaos, but it's time we put your chemistry to use. Your toxins are already en route to finish the job. But we're going to clean up here a bit first, to make sure those theaters are filled. Punchline says that Batman's going to come for him. Isn't he even a little worried? And the Joker laughs, <laughs> Not at all! Just need to put on my new suit for when he arrives. Elsewhere in a location, the Bat family gathers and Batman tells them that he is glad that they are here. He should have brought them in from the beginning. The last year has been hard, but he thinks that he's seen clearly for the first time in a long time. The city is in chaos. Joker is using everything that he built up to lay the city to waste, and it's only going to get worse. Batwoman and the GCPD are already storming Wayne Enterprises, and is going to cut off the new supply of vehicles and weapons. And Lucius has been rescued. Right now, theaters are filling all over Gotham, and Joker's going to play a movie, and then he's going to kill them. They need to stop it, and stop the violence on the streets, and it's a lot to ask, but he knows that he can trust them to take the city back. Dick Grayson asks, where will he go? And Batman says, Ace Chemical, to end this. Harley jumps down from the back, stating that she's going with him so that she can kill the Joker. Batman tells her that that isn't going to happen, and Harley shouts, asking, why the hell not? That's the whole reason I even came here. Batgirl yells that they don't have time for this, and Red Hood says, She's right. We've got incoming. Several buildings away, a clown fires a rocket, and Batman turns back, throwing a battering, intercepting it. The clown watches the rocket detonate, and then laughs, stating that he's going to buy an island with their heads. But Spoiler and Orphan tell him, No, you won't. As everyone then gets ready to move out, Dick tells Batman that he needs to go. The rest of them will get the city under control. But before Dick can leave, Batman tells him to wait, and he pulls out a case. As he opens it... Dick sees the Nightwing costume, and Batman tells him that it's good to have him back. A short while later, Batman jumps down and begins to walk in when he hears a gunshot. He stops to look back, and a second shot is fired, grazing his shoulder. Damn it, Harley! Harley asks, why the hell do you think I kept saving your life? Didn't you get the big picture? It's time for the Joker's story to end. Batman rushes back, grabbing her, telling her, I cannot let that happen. And Harley yells, that's not good enough anymore! I should have let the toxin do its job. I thought you'd pull your head out and see what we needed to do. She pushes herself back, telling him that she knows that he can just take her out. So here's the deal. If the Joker kills him, she's taking the shot. Screw whatever code they have. If the Joker's going to get away with killing all those people, she'll shoot him down. Batman tells her no, and Harley says that if that's the case, then put her down. Hard. Make sure she doesn't get back up. This story needs to change. It needs an ending. Batman takes one last look at Harley, and instead of subduing her, he walks inside of the facility. And as the door opens, Batman calls out, It's over! We'll have the city back in a few hours. You're going to be incarcerated before then. So do whatever you're going to do, but just know, I'm ready for it. Joker calls out, Really? You didn't treat the dead back at the Monarch very well. But this one, this one is special, and saving it for the grand finale, dug him up myself. 
An infected Alfred shuffles his way forward with his neck snapped and spinning as he says, Batman steps back. No, this isn't real. He then hears the cocking of a gun and the Joker steps out wearing the experimental bat suit from when he was poisoned. And Joker says, I promised you weren't ready for this at all. Later, back at the clock tower over in Burnside, Batgirl takes off her mask, telling the computer to become active. She's going to need eyes everywhere. Activate all CCTV systems, traffic cams, and cell data. She takes a seat, grabbing her eyeglasses, stating, it's time to let everyone know the Oracle is back online. Oracle sends out a broadcast to every TV cell phone in the city, telling them that she's going to tell them what they already know. What they're all witnessing is happening because of a horrible web of money and corruption that is paralyzing the city's institutions. What the Joker planned at the theaters was meant to kill everyone, so stay inside and lock your doors. Meanwhile, Nightwing fights his way through another group of clowns and he says, That just gave me chills. And Batgirl tells him that she's pretty sure that that's just him adjusting to the cold spandex in the night air again. It's good to see him back in blue. And the clown behind you has a gun. Nightwing laughs as he throws his baton back at the clown, stating, Oh, I know, already saw that. Any word from the big guy? Back over at Ace Chemical, Joker fires his gun, asking, Is it my new outfit, or is the present a bit much for you, Batman? Batman rushes to get Alfred's body out of the way of the gunfire, and he says that he's just trying to get in his head, and it's not working. As a batarang is thrown, knocking the gun out of the Joker's hand, the Joker says, You really don't like those, do you? Oh well, there are so many little explosives in this suit. Joker throws his modified batarangs past Batman, and as they stick into the tanks behind him, they explode, releasing the chemicals. Batman picks up Alfred, telling Batgirl that he's going to need backup. The Joker has taken Alfred's body and is weaponizing it. But just then, the radio short out and the Joker asks, What are you doing? Calling for help is cheating! Good thing I just killed the radio with your fancy doohickey! He then stabs Batman in the back and Batman yells for him to shut up! Joker tells him, come on, let's be honest, is the costume right? I finally look as stupid as... Batman spins back, punching the Joker, shouting for him, shut up! Joker laughs, <laughs> that's the spirit! But that's not enough, Bats. See, the city needs a new Kate Crusader! Hell, maybe you can be the new Joker. Doesn't that sound like fun? Roll reversals are all the rage. Batman reaches for a button on his belt and soon the lights go out and Joker yells, we both know that bats can see in the dark. Just then Batman punches and shatters the helmet the Joker's wearing telling him, you are not a bat. Joker is thrown over the ledge and as he bounces off the ground, he reaches for a device, pressing a button. Okay then, let's try this another way. As the explosions go off elsewhere, Punchline says that this, this wasn't supposed to happen, we're not ready yet. She grabs the radio, screaming, telling the clowns to give her something, but as she waits, she gets nothing. And a few moments later, the underbroker steps out. I'm sorry to inform you, but I must bring our dealings with you and the Joker to an end. Punchline shouts, asking, are you serious? We've given you more money than God. And the underbroker tells her, true, but that money has been taken. Should you come across any more money in the future, you know how to contact me. Punchline takes out her phone, calling for the Joker, and as she gets his voicemail, she tells him it's all over. She's sorry. She thought she'd be able to handle things a little better. She remembers the plan and she loves him. She'll never stop believing. As she looks back, she sees Nightwing standing there and he says, Oh, I've heard a song like that before. Hi, we haven't met. Well, not really. I've been out of town for a little bit. Back over with Batman. He calls out to the Joker that it's over. His family has taken the city back. There isn't going to be a war. Joker laughs as he appears behind, stating, That's the thing! You've already missed the war! We're on to the aftermath, Bats! He slams his knife into Batman's back and twists, stating, The theaters were just to get under your skin! This whole thing, it's about the two of us! It's about this suit! The suit you'd wear when you finally saved Gotham once and for all! <laughs> Whatever future you dreamed of where you got to wear this shiny costume, it's all gone! That picture of retirement ruined! Fire soon begin to spread throughout the plant and the Joker laughs, telling him, This will break everything! No one will have faith in anything anymore, and why should they? It didn't stop a few clowns from flying a bat plane through their window, and neither did Batman! Shouldn't you have stopped it all before it happened? It's going to be so much harder, building back everything from scratch! And just as the Joker raises his knife, there's a bang and a bullet in the Joker's eye. The Joker falls back, shouting, Oh! But Harley walks in with her gun, stating, Hey, long time no see, Mr. J. 
the Joker last stating, Ah, you didn't get the kill shot, though! And she says that it has to come from him. As Harley handcuffs the Joker, Batman asks what she's doing, and Harley sets down her backpack and pulls out two bombs, telling him, We're going to have ourselves a little game. You're going to have to make a decision. She straps one bomb to the Joker and the other to herself, and Batman tells her that this isn't how it has to end. They can lock him up. Harley says no. The Joker is too dangerous to just lock up. It's not good enough anymore. Right now, you're going to have to choose either her or him. You only have enough time to get to one of them. Who is it going to be? The Joker starts to laugh. <laughs> I really do love a wild card. Looks like you're going to have to save me. You wouldn't risk leaving me in the butler to roast, right? The two men stare at each other for a moment, and Batman begins to walk in the direction that Harley ran off to. Joker asks him, What are you doing? Come back here! Don't walk away from me, Batman! At that moment, Alfred begins to laugh, and the Joker turns back, telling him, Shut up! Just shut up! But there's a ticket coming from Alfred, and a few seconds later, another explosion. A big explosion. A week later, Harley wakes up in the hospital bed, stating that she just had the weirdest dream. He was there. And this mean lady with a dumb name who wasn't even funny, how long has it been? Batman tells her a week, and Harley smiles, stating that she knew that that bomb was a good one. But he almost fooled her. Is he dead? Batman tells her that he found the Joker's bomb intact, deactivated just in time with the tools used from the Batsuit that he was wearing, and there's no sign of him. Harley sighs, stating, yeah, the Joker never really was an encore kind of clown. When the big show ends, he heads underground. Batman looks out at the windows, and as he takes in the city, he says that the city has changed. Harley tells him, sure, it's uglier. But it's always been kind of ugly. A big city full of ugly people doing ugly things. But he? He makes sure that everyone stays alive, and that's pretty neat. Batman smiles, stating that he buried his father again today. But he did so with his family. And he once said that every fight with the Joker is a fight against death itself. And that fighting is living. Maybe Batman is ready for that fight. Everything else has been lost, but what comes next is going to be hard. But he can meet it head on. He can be a better man. He can be a better Batman. But somewhere out there, there is another. They look over the projection stating, Bruce, oh Bruce, 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 what a mess you've made. Our teachers would be ashamed of you. I think it's time that your city has a choice in its protector. The truce is over. It's time for Gotham to meet. The Ghost Maker. Meanwhile, over in the Narrows, a boy walks through the city, playing his games on his phone. As he opens the door to a disorganized apartment, he sees a man standing there. Batman looks back, telling him, I know your secret, Clown Hunter. The boy says, You know, this is kind of weird. I wasn't expecting any company. The boy takes off his coat, and Batman goes on, Your name is Bao Fam. And Bao says, That's a neat trick. We're both men of talents. Batman's real name is Dirk Wellington. Batman goes on, your parents were killed by the Joker five years ago. But Bao stops him, telling him, If we're gonna do this, we gotta do it the right way. I need my mask. As Bao grabs his helmet, Batman asks, How many clowns did you kill? And Bao says that he was trying to keep count, but he got it all screwed up. And, uh, not enough? Yeah, not enough. Batman asks, Why did you do it? And he yells, Because after the third night of clowns firebombing the place, he realized Batman wasn't coming. They had to be stopped. It was stupid for him to believe in a guy that could save him. Or his parents or anyone. The cops came by. They said the clowns dug up my parents. They found the remains burning in a theater in Crime Alley. They also said that there were batarangs at the scene. You punched my dead mom and dad and you set them on fire and you let the devil live. And now, all those who wore the clown mask just get to take them off and walk down the street like nothing happened. So what now? Are you going to arrest me? Batman tells him no. The neighborhood supports him, and turning him in won't do any good. But there is an option. He hands him a card telling him that this will get him in touch with Leslie Tompkins if she can help him. Batman leaves and Bao says help would be nice. But maybe when he's finished. Meanwhile, over in Robbinsville, two men sit at a bar in a diner and one says to the other that it's a rather large stack of papers. The second man flips through the headlines of the Joker and punchline stating that he was in an accident a few weeks back needs to catch up on what's been happening. The first man points to a headline with punchline stating that there's plenty to go around. They haven't stopped investigating that Wayne fella and there's a clown girl all over the papers. The second man says that she's a real treat hunter. The first man laughs, telling her, I don't go much for the crazy type. The second man says, Oh, but there's so much fun. At least until they slip a knife between your ribs. The two begin to laugh again as the first man says that he's a 
funny one. The second man tells him, I used to be a comedian. The first one reaches for his phone, stating that the punchline girl, though. She's under house arrest after they figured she wasn't crazy enough to be locked up in Arkham. She put out a video on the internet that's got people talking. Here, check it out. The man holds up the phone and he taps in an app, and a second later, Punchline appears on the screen. She explains that many of them know her as Punchline, but her real name is Alexis K. Like many of them, she is a victim of the Joker, and she goes on to explain her thoughts and feelings and how she believed in the Joker's cause, and she learned how horrible they were. A second man chuckles. Oh, she's good. She even said what she was doing right there in the video. She spread his message. Ha! Ah, the trial is going to be a circus. There's no better place for a clown. <laughs> <laughs> the second man lights a cigarette and the first one asks him, it's not you, you're not him, are you? And the man laughs, no, 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 but you are. The second man exhales and he blows smoke into the first man's face and the second man continues, well, at least you'll be my body. They'll find it done by the docks in a day or two, all bloated, skin bleached, just right. The first man grabs his throat and he begins to cough and he falls off of the counter. The second man flicks his cigarette, pulling out red lipstick, stating, We just have to get you just right. A few moments later, the first man's skin turns white and a big red smile appears across his face as the second man says, Very, very good. And there's another full story right here at the Comic Story and Full Story channel. This is a channel where we just re-upload some of our underperforming ones from the other channel to appease the algorithm and see if we have a channel that only does full stories, how that would affect things. I hope you guys enjoyed it, but don't forget you can get up-to-date brand new videos by joining the main channel, Comic Story. Thank you, and I'll see you next time.